clarity of thought and unity of purpose as we discuss the important matters before us. We humbly ask that you would guide and direct us in all that we do. Amen. Amen. Okay. Before we start, I'm just going to make sure that my sound's off before I tell everybody else to turn theirs off. Good morning and welcome to this meeting of the Council. For the benefit of those who are vulnerable or otherwise anxious about becoming ill, we ask that you continue to respect the decision of those who still wear a face mask. If you are wearing a mask, please would you remove it while speaking. Please do not hold the microphone by the stems as they are very expensive to repair. For the benefit of those watching the live stream, please use your microphone every time you speak, including when participating in a recorded vote. Otherwise, your voice will not be heard. You may find it easier to be seated whilst using your microphone. I do propose to take, as we do in each meeting, a 20-minute break at approximately 12.30, unless we finish by then, to allow those of you who wish to take a refreshment to do so. So we will move on to item one, which is the apologies, which will be read by the Chief Executive. Apologies have been received from the following councillors, Andy Boddington, Ted Clark, Rosemary Darknell, Julian Dean, David Evans, Mike Isherwood, Ed Potter, and Robert Tyndall. Thank you. Thank you. Item two, art disclosable. Chairman, yeah. can I add... All oh, right, sorry, uh, Roger, yeah. Yeah, can I add Richard, uh, 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 Richard Huffer and Andy Boddington to that list, and Colin Taylor? Yep. I'm not sure if that all those were included, but those Yeah, you did were. mention those before the meeting, and I had suggested you let Andy know. So, Claire, I can see an arm there. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I'd like to declare a personal and prejudicial interest in item number two. I've got to item two, yeah. Let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> let me finish reading it out. We we're still doing apologies. <laughs> That's all right. Don't worry. Oh, item two is disclosable, disclosable pecuniary interest. And I... I would remind members to disclose any pecuniary and other registrable or non-registrable interest in any matter to be discussed, including an interest in their register of interests, and leave the chamber prior to the matter being discussed. Claire, did you have something to say? Thank you, Mr Chairman. Sorry, number two was on the board at the time. Anyway, yeah. I'd like to declare a personal and prejudicial interest in item number 10, and I will leave the room. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Leslie Picton, I too will declare an interest in item number 10 uh, and leave the room. Jeff? Um, similarly, um, item number 10, I will need to leave the room also. Good. Any more for any more? No? Nope. Okay, we will move on to item three, which are the minutes. And I'm going to move the minutes of the previous council meeting that was held on the 29th of February. I will second those minutes as circulated with the agenda papers. And obviously you've just heard Brian, everyone wants to get this over really quickly today. They're speaking before I finished. Well, you paused, Jeff. You paused pregnantly. Yes, to breathe. Anyway, members can only raise an item of questioning on the accuracy of the minutes. They can't raise a matter of question, exploration, or debate. Obviously, Brian has seconded that. I'm looking around the room. Is everybody content with those minutes? Okay. Uh, we'll move on then to item four, which is announcements, um, which is to receive the communications that you've had via email of what myself and Vice Chair Brian have done, um, and to receive any communications. Uh, and the head of paid service may desire to lay before the council. I think there's nothing, is there? So, okay, we all have those. Good. Item. Five is public questions. So, in accordance with Procedure Rule 14, we will now deal with the questions from members in the public. And in accordance with the uh, revised procedure rules, the Assistant Director of Legal and Democratic Services will read out public questions received from members of the public who are not present. The relevant portfolio hold holder will respond to the questions. We have had six public questions, and the first public question 
is from Kate Butler, which I believe Tim Collard is going to read. Tim. Yes, thank you. Her question is this. Shropshire Council announced a climate emergency in 2019 and aims for the Council to become carbon net neutral by 2030. Can the Council provide their justification of the carbon impact of the planned demolition of Shah Hall to then build a new civic hub in the Riverside development? It is well established within the built environment that the retrofitting and the reuse of an existing building is more carbon effective than demolition a new build. How does this align with their 2030 net neutral strategy? Okay, and I believe the response is coming from Councillor Ian Nellins, the portfolio holder for climate change, environment and transport. Councillor Nellins. Thank you very much for the question. Um, to be really clear, Shower Hall has a massive carbon footprint and costs the council in excess of 1.3 million per year to keep it open. A large part of the cost related to the outdated and the inefficient heating and lighting system and the building fabric is thermally ineffective and as are many 1960s buildings of this ilk. Also, the ongoing life cycle costs of, for investment in the building's fabric has been detailed in previous reports to the Council on this issue. We see our proposals as being consistent with our climate uh, declaration. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from Patricia Capolo. I hope I've pronounced that right. Patricia? As a 78-year-old resident of Shrewsbury, I would like to have some. I would like. I have had some excellent support from Age Concern over the last few months and years. Their advisors and volunteers really helped me with some difficulties, as well as understanding the new ways of accessing public services, which are increasingly complicated. They provide a very valuable service for older people. I saw that the council had announced large-scale cuts in its services for the next year. Can you explain whether these budget cuts will impact on grants to voluntary organisations in Shropshire? Will the work of age concern be affected by a reduced grant from the council? I hope you will ensure that some funding is retained to support older residents, as we're still paying our council tax every month and contributing to our county as valued <coughs> members of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe Councillor Cecilia Motley is the portfolio holder for adult social care and public health is going to provide the answer. Cecilia? Yes, How long will we be waiting? All right, okay. That wasn't really a wait. Cecilia, can I, can I ask if you would use your mic, please? You've got your computer in front of your voice I, and, and the microphone. Sorry. Uh, I'm not having a great start to the morning, am I? <laughs> no. Mine's going down with yours, don't worry. All right. <laughs> I apologise. And to continue, um, you will appreciate uh, that the local authority is navigating a very challenging time uh, but we would like to reassure you that we remain fully committed to the health and well-being of our residents and we will continue to prioritise investment in our local voluntary and community sector, thus maintaining the capacity of organisations such as Aid UK. Aside from ensuring better outcomes for residents, this approach also ensures future cost savings by addressing issues at, at an earlier stage, of, therefore avoiding crisis or preventing them altogether. Strategically, we're working hard to protect and ideally bolster the capacity of our voluntary and community sector in order to create communities that promote people's independence through access to support and activities that promote well-being, 
and also by building structures and systems that help residents to navigate to guidance and support at an early stage. This is part of our collective one structure approach where we are working on with a range of key stakeholders across our health and care system to connect with our communities through offers designed to meet residents' needs and improve their health and well-being. We're very grateful for your <coughs> question and comments, which further illustrates the importance of ensuring investment uh, in this area is prioritised. And furthermore, we're delighted to hear how the provision has supported you directly. At Shropshire Council, we are hearing from and working with local residents about what they think is working well and when improvements could ideally be made within social care provision. If you'd like to become more involved in how Shropshire Council shapes the offer to residents, then please let us know and we can arrange to share more information about how to get involved. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the next question is from Victoria Moore. Um, Tim, I believe you're going to read this one. The question is this. Page 162 of Appendix 3 of the Shropshire Council Financial Strategy 2024-25, there is an item regarding Otley Road Shrewsbury traffic management improvements, with the detail being traffic flow improvements and road safety on Otley Road and an allocation of £1 million funded from developer Section 106 contributions. What are these improvements and what is the cost of the various elements? As Section 106 funds have been allocated to the community centre and children's playground, how much will be spent on each? Where are the plans and where will construction begin? The second Otley Road development public consultation describes 230 homes and 40% affordable but no social housing which is the principal need. It is unclear whether the community centre squeezed into a small quadrilateral adjacent to the A5, along with children's playground, are the same structures already promised in the first Section 106 agreement. There is very little available green space on the current development, and this is proposed to be shared with the proposed new development. There is no current GP surgery, pharmacy or school, and no space for these. All active travel routes on both the current and proposed developments are shared, and one on the new proposal is a public right-of-way. No bus provisions are mentioned, other than the current on-demand, apart from a possible bus gate on the proposed new development. How will Shropshire Council provide the necessary infrastructure of GP surgery, pharmacy, schools, green space, leisure areas, public transport, and active travel. Thank you. Um, there is a bit of an orchestra going on at the moment with people's computers. If you would just click on the icon that has a speaker on it and click on the speaker, it will mute it. Thank you. There's another one just to remind you what I'm talking about. So. Councillor Chris Schofield, Portfolio Holder for Planning and Regulatory Service, I believe is going to provide the answer. Councillor Schofield. <clears throat> thank you, Chair, and thank you for your email, Victoria. Um, it is Shropshire Council's intention to implement a highways improvement scheme along Otley Road, which embraces the principles of the Shrewsbury South Sustainable Urban Extension Master Plan document. The design is currently being developed by our consultants, WSP, and works will be subject to further public engagement and costings in due course. There is currently no active funding allocated to Otley Road. Section 106 funds have been collected from the, the Sioux South development at Otley Road to contribute to the development of a community centre. Across the whole Sioux, 400,000 of Section 106 funding has been collected. The preferred site for the community centre has been identified but as yet, there are no plans for this development and construction has not begun. 250,000 of the community infrastructure levy from the scheme was ring-fenced to develop the play facilities in the site, on the site. The proposed new development off Otley Road is not currently subject to a formal planning application. The scale and housing need will be assessed as part of any future application. Whilst there is not this is not the subject of a live planning application. 
and therefore not for the Council to offer comment at this stage. It is understood the community centre land identified on this scheme is not the same structure, is the same structure, pardon, as identified as in the original Sioux. The proposed new development of, of the road is not currently subject to formal planning applications. The scale and housing need together with green space will be assessed as part of any future application. There is no GP surgery, pharmacy or school directly associated with the development of the Sioux. However, the Sioux has provided 500,000 of Section 106 funding towards additional education provision in Shrewsbury. The active travel routes for the wider Shrewsbury South Sustainable Urban Extension were considered as part of the original Outline Planning Permission and subsequent Reserve Matter Planning applications. Active travel and connect connectivity will be assessed as any future planning application. Shropshire Council are currently in the process of reviewing the bus provision along Otley Road. It is likely the bus provision will be on-demand service funded by development, developer contributions. And on the question of how will Shropshire Council provide the necessary infrastructure of GP surgery, pharmacy and schools, you see uh, the responses to my earlier answers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. The next question is from Tamarin Bebo. Thank you. Tamarin. Thank you. I am the owner of Wrighton Hall in Wrighton 11 Towns and have lived in the property with my husband and young family since Jan 2022. We live right on top of the B4397, linking the A5 at Shotatton Crossroads with Bass Church, a route that is heavily used by traffic of all sorts, heading to and from the industrial estates and business parks on the north side of Shrewsbury as a rat run. Now, I know that not all of the HGVs, vans and cars which blight our village can be diverted onto more suitable roads. But it is clear that those through drivers would not choose to use, use lanes through rural villages like our own if there were a quicker and better route. However, at present, the only practical alternative is to use the A5 Southern Bypass, the A49, etc., which for those of you who know, is a very much less direct route. I have been a parish councillor for nearly two years and I'm delighted that Shropshire Council supports Councillor Dan Morris, Cabinet Man Member for Highways, in moving the project forward. I would very much like him now to supply more detail as to the next steps, how quickly he expects the final business case to be completed, and when we might expect to see a start in constructing this very much needed new road. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Dan Morris. Thank you, Tamarin, for your question. Um, a very real and lived experience of the traffic blight that some people experience. Um, I can confirm that the traffic modelling submitted with the successful North West Relief Road planning application and endorsed by National Highways and Shropshire Council Highways fully supports the statement made on existing through traffic in places such as Wrighton rerouting to more appropriate roads on completion of the North West Relief Road. In line with the current programme, the submission of the full business case to the DFT is expected by December 24 at the latest. Once approved, this would allow construction of the North West Relief Road to commence in spring 2025. Thank you. The next question is from Michael Dineen. Mr. Dean here. No, Tim. Thank you. How much does the budget of £41,655,000 for the refocused Shah Hall relocation Civic Centre or Hub exceed or is less than the cost of refurbishing the existing Shah Hall and allowing for commercial letting of excess space not required? by Shropshire Council for its own use. Has a report been prepared on the office and property needs of Shropshire Council in Shrewsbury? And if so, has it considered how they can be met in the existing building? 
and I believe Councillor Dean Carroll was the portfolio holder for housing and assets will respond. Councillor Carroll. Yes, thank you very much for your question, Mr. Dean. On the 24th of February 2022, full council formally declared the Shire Hall building surplus to requirements and delegated to officers the ability to agree and implement the disposal strategy and agree terms for sale subject to the final approval of full council. On the 14th of December 2023, full council agreed activity to move forward the decommissioning and disposal in private session. Shire Hall has failed technically, functionally and economically, and of course its green credentials are extremely poor. Detailed work was undertaken in terms of feasibility for the refurbishment of the Shire Hall and related to the key decisions taken at the council meeting of the 16th of July 2020. In the report, it advised that the stage two financial business case, as prepared by Ryder Levitt Bucknell, identified an estimated cost of £24.1 million. This was on the basis of refurbishing the Shire Hall, which was presented to full council in December 2018. Due to inflation and comparable scope of works, this figure is likely now to be in excess of £30 million. To be really clear, Shire Hall has massive ongoing life cycle cost maintenance and energy requirements that would require significant investment in both the structure and fabric and electrical and mechanical systems. These have been detailed in previous reports to the Council. The figure of 41,655,000 for the refocused Shire Hall relocation, the otherwise known as Civic Centre or multi-agency hub, is not recognised in this context and is presumably is taken from a previous Council paper. The commitment to deliver a multi-agency hub as part of the Riverside redevelopment remains and work is underway supported by central government funding to deliver demolition and enabling work with the substan substantive planning approval now in place and recent consultation completed on the next application, work is moving at pace. The business case for a new modern office development which would take the form of the multi-agency hub is being developed and this will take into account likely income streams from tenants in the form of both commercial and public sector partners. The viability of this aspect of development will be fully tested within the context of the wider town centre redevelopment and will be put before full council for final decision. The council currently plans to take one small part of the building reflective of the transformation and changes which the organisation is going through and the resultant changes in demand for physical space both centrally and across the county. The council, working on the principles of the Shropshire Plan, now requires less than half of the net floor area used by Shropshire Council in the past. It is proposed that the gross internal area shrinks from the 18,520 square metres at Shire Hall to approximately 10,800 square metres in the multi-agency hub, of which the council requirement currently stands at 4,200 square metres, with the rest potentially let to key public sector partners or other commercial tenants. Hence, the council's organisational financial commitment as part of a new office development will also be put before full council for a decision based on the business case, and this is distinct from the financial case for the whole multi-agency hub office development. The council no longer needs an administrative base of the scope and scale of the Shire Hall, and due to the current market decline in demand for office space, other interest has been extremely limited for Shire Hall. The disposal strategy is currently in the process of being developed by Cornovi Developments Limited, in conjunction with the council's estates team, which will consider the future uses of the site and its context within Shrewsbury and its locality. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question is from Andrew Bebb. Tim, I believe you're going to read this one. Thank you. His question is this. Can you please explain why the award-winning health checks conducted in the county's livestock markets are being reduced in terms of frequency and what plans are in place for the continuation of this essential service beyond September. Thank you. And again, I believe Councillor Cecilia Motley, the Portfolio of Adult Social Care and Public Health, is replying to this. Cecilia? Thank you, Chairman. Right on the ball this time. Good. 
thank you for the question. Shropshire Council's public health team work actively to support our most vulnerable communities through preventative work to tackle health inequalities, including work in our rural communities. And one example is the award-winning health checks for the Farming Community Programme in partnership with Shropshire Rural Support, the Royal Agricultural Benevolent Institution, the NFU National Farmers Union, and the Livestock Markets, alongside our an animal welfare officers that launched in January 2023 at Shrewsbury Life Livestock Market. Overall, the programme has grown and expanded in the short time since it launched to now include five livestock markets all around the county with regular visits from the Community Wellbeing Outreach Team to carry out health checks and signpost wellbeing support. This ensures that farmers from across the county and their, and their uh, um, dependents now have access to this valuable offer. This work has always been funded by temporary one-off opportunistic grant funding initially arising from the pandemic and has continued to be supported through ring fence reserves. As such, the service that we provide is led by the need in each community as well as the resource that is available with close partnership working to inform the development of the service. Officers continue to actively explore new sources of funding and grants to extend our core statutory services to improve access to our communities, including health checks for the farming community. Over the last three years, our public health team have been successful in securing approximately £5 million in external funds to support such activities. Shropshire Council remains committed to prioritising support for our farming community and we'll share further updates with key stakeholders, including Shropshire Rural Support, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> now, the next thing we are going to deal with is a petition, because a petition bearing over 1,000 signatures has been received from the Shrewsbury bid, requesting a debate under the Council's petition scheme. The petition requests that the Council halt damaging parking charge hikes. Um, the petitioners will be allowed five minutes to outline their case, after which there will be a debate of up to 15 minutes maximum. I believe a Mr. Darren Tompkins is going to present the position, uh, the petition, sorry, for Shrewsbury's bid. Darren. Thank you. Five minutes to sum up the concerns and fears of businesses, workers and residents from across the county and town. I'll give it a go. Good morning, and thank you all for the opportunity to present this petition to you today. As we heard, my name is Darren Tompkins. I'm a local business owner and trader at the Market Hall Shrewsbury, and also a member of the Shrewsbury Bid Board of Directors. On behalf of the Shrewsbury Town Centre businesses, and alongside the partners in, our Shrews in the Shrewsbury Business Chamber, we are calling on Shropshire Council to halt its proposals for damaging car parking tariff increases. As Shropshire's county town, Shrewsbury serves as a vibrant economic service centre whilst providing employment to thousands of residents across the county. Shropshire Council's proposal to increase charges between 50 to 67% in the town's most affordable car parks has raised serious concerns about the potential lasting economic impact on Shrewsbury Town Centre. Over 750 Shrewsbury Town Centre businesses rely on Shropshire Council as a partner to provide decent and affordable access to their staff and customers, making Shropshire Council an intrinsic part of every business's business plan. It would be unthinkable for any other business to increase prices for their staff and most local customers from £4.80 a day to £8 a day. Would Shropshire Council consider imposing such a charge on its own staff to park during their work days at Shire Hall? Season tickets. For those who can afford the significant upfront costs, offer limited savings on the daily rate. The price of a season ticket is also set to increase by up to 67% raising the cheapest season ticket available from £480 to £800 a year. By the Council's own admission, this existing public transport offer in Shrewsbury does not provide a viable alternative to support these increases. In particular, the park and ride service falls short of an adequate alternative due to its limited schedule and frequency, particularly outside the regular working hours and on a Sunday. Additionally, for those who need to commute in the early morning or late evening hours, or who reside in areas not well served by public transport. Park and ride is neither practical nor reliable. Shrewsbury's public transport network is in its present state is insufficient substitute to town centre parking. 
There is now a huge concern for recruitment and retention of staff across all sectors. A day's parking will cost at least three pounds more per day than it does in the cheapest car parks in Telford, Chester, and Hereford, and at least eight pounds more per day than working at any many of the out of town locations with free parking. Despite big pressures on the public sector, we cannot find any increases of this size across the country. On top of this, proposals to extend parking charges to 8pm and remove free parking on Sundays will undoubtedly lead to fewer people coming into town at those times. For the hospitality sector, this will be disastrous. Shrewsbury Bid has carried out an extensive economic assessment of the current proposals. We predict a mid-case annual drop of £7 million in consumer spending and a drop-off of 250000 in footfall. This would be hugely challenging for many of the town's businesses who are operating on incredibly tight or zero margins after a period of high inflation and a high cost of living. Future investment in the town, which we all want to see, could also be severely hindered. Many significant businesses have told us, or have been reported in the press, are seriously considering their future in the town centre, citing increased costs of parking as one of the major concerns. As a representative of the market hall, with 50 plus businesses employing 200 plus staff, lack of adequate parking or any loss of parking will be devastating for the traders and the 500,000 visitors we could get per year. Our model also shows that the council is by no means guaranteed to generate additional income from this strategy. This is especially true if businesses close due to a declining trade. Shrewsbury Bid strongly supports the vision for transforming movement in and around the town as set out in the Shrewsbury Move strategy. But it's our strong belief that any changes to town centre access must be implemented thoughtfully in a joined up and managed way and we must not discourage access by car before implementing attractive alternatives. We very much welcome the decision by the scrutiny committee to refer car parking tariff proposals back to cabinet and Shrewsbury Bid are in discussions with senior officers about a possible way forward. But today we wanted to bring the serious concerns of our 500 plus businesses and employees as well as the 4,000 plus signatures of our petition directly to the attention of the council. We sincerely ask this council to, one, limit future tariff increases in line with inflation. Two, consult the business community on all changes to the town centre access. And three, implement coordinated plans to transform movement and grow the economy. Thank you very much. Well done. Your early concerns were uh, not met. You managed it. Well done. Thank you very much. Okay, now I am going to go to the portfolio holder, Councillor Morris, with a reply uh, for the council. And at the end of the debate, which will start, uh, we will then go with the range of options that are uh, there. I did see you, Alex. Councillor Morris. Um, I'd like to thank the petitioners for bringing their petition to council, for which the council will write to them, setting out the council's views officially. When these changes were first proposed, we knew they wouldn't be universally popular. But the council asked people to understand the reasons behind the, um, the increases. And these are to encourage people to park outside the River Severn Loop, to encourage alternative modes of transport into town, to enable the council to better maintain our car parks and bring them up to standard, to strengthen the Shropshire Council parking team to enable them to look at issues like on-street parking in residential areas and to support the Shrewsbury Move strategy. This council is not immune to the same inflationary pressures as, other ta as town centre businesses have. For example, an egg mayonnaise sandwich in a well-known national food chain in 2020 was £1.89. Today it is £2.99. That is a 60% increase. A coffee in another well-known national establishment that is in Shrewsbury in August 21 was £3.05. Today it is £4.50. That's a 48% increase in cost. The council has the same inflationary pressures as businesses do. If Shropshire Council had followed the RPI, since 2018, parking charges would have increased by 49% on average. The proposal, as it, as it was put, puts them on average at 40%. So Shropshire Council is still below the average it would have been had it had followed the RPI changes. <coughs> Shrewsbury Bid, Shropshire Bid, uh, Shrewsbury Bid, who have bought the petition, I'm, I mean, I've, I've no idea what they 
charged to, to be a member of that, but I'm sure the costs of running that organisation too have increased. Every organisation has faced inflationary pressures and the council is not immune. All that said, and as a result of the concerns raised by the bid and some of the proposals being referred back to Cabinet by the Economy and Environment Scrutiny Committee, the Council have been carefully considering the original proposals. Some changes are being looked at and will be presented to Cabinet for consideration at its April meeting. And as we've said previously, we agree that improvements to the reliability and the frequency of the park and ride services is required. This is something that the Council is working on. Thank you. Thank you very much. I had Councillor Alex Wagner indicate. So I'm, I'm not going to do my maths on egg mayonnaise sandwiches, but I'm going to do my maths on what was in the last budget. Um, Jeremy Hunt announced a national insurance cut. It's going to be on rather a lot of election leaflets this year on the other side of the chamber. The average worker is going to benefit from that to the tune of about £450 per year. The increase in parking at the most affordable location in or around Shrewsbury Town Centre for a lower paid worker who can't pay the upfront season ticket fee is going to be in the region of five to seven hundred pounds a year. So quite short of a plan for drivers and quite short of cutting the fees people pay to uh, government, people are going to be paying an awful lot more to be parking in Shrewsbury and it's going to wipe out some of the national changes being made. Um, the main reason I'm quite annoyed about this is because I think it's pretty random. We've got these 67% increases at some, 29 at others, 0% at Raven Meadows in the middle of town. It doesn't make any sense. And I, I was very happy to sign the bids petition and to support their efforts as a result. The issue, though, I want to focus in on is what I mentioned right at the beginning. The finances of it for town centre workers, who are generally lower paid people, are appalling. This penalises people who are filling in vital jobs in our economy. Um, and also it penalises the businesses who, as has been mentioned by the bid, are really, really struggling to recruit at the moment. I think when I talk to people in the town across Shrewsbury and across the county for that matter who run businesses, recruitment is the big issue at the moment in Shropshire's economy, getting working age people in, getting them to our town centres, working in hospitality, working in health, working in all of these important economic and social services, that's where we're lacking. And I'm of the view that you can sometimes put parking charges up and it not have a huge effect on visitor numbers. I'm of the view that councils do have to increase it with RPI sometimes and that ideally you can find ways to improve public transport, active travel, introduce strategies like Shrewsbury moves. But we're not doing that. What's being proposed is something pretty random that hurts town centre workers and people who have to come into the town, especially, as I say, early and late at night, who don't have much choice but to pay for parking in Shropshire Council car parks. And those are the people who actually this county needs more than any at the moment. Because in our economy, if you go around the town centre, that is where we're lacking. That is why GP services and pharmacies are relying on locums. That is why hospitality trades have um, signs in their windows looking for more staff. If we're penalising those people, then what hope do we have? I won't take any more time because I know it's a short debate. I'm looking around the room. I have seen no other hands. Oh, all of a sudden there's a plethora of hands. Roger, then Julia. Uh, bear in mind that there is only 15 minutes from when the speaker finished and the debate started, so off you go. Thank you, Chairman. I time this debate is starting at 10.36 after the portfolio had spoken. Uh, mm -hmm. But, yeah, I note what the portfolio holder said, but if one looks at the quarter three figures and the budget for the council, you can see there the income that this council made from parking and you can see the expenses that were incurred and there is quite a few million pound difference. Parking fees are supposed to be used to assist the parking, maintain it, not to help general purposes. So I cannot understand why this need is, is there to be increased because it is obvious from what was said, it is there to meet the towards the 62 million pound this council black hole that has to be filled. That is not what parking charges are for. It should be primarily used to assist with parking and transport, not to be used to finance councils. And I was a little bit surprised with the reply by the portfolio holder. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Buckley. I'm afraid that I agree with both the two previous speakers that um, 
although the report on parking was a very unpleasant surprise for everybody in the county, it was certainly not random. It very clearly aimed to generate £2 million surplus to fill a black hole in the budget, something which is <coughs> technically against the law, which is presumably why our call-in was successful at scrutiny. I was intrigued to hear Councillor Dan Morris reiterate that the aim of the proposal was to encourage parking outside the loop, because the proposals, of course, wanted to increase the charges by 67% to only those outside the loop. He also reiterated that the intention was to invest in the parking team and maintain our assets. The budget clearly showed that could be done for 300,000 and does not cost 2 million. What also came out in the call-in scrutiny meeting is that, in fact, every year for the last three years, the parking team have generated a million pounds surplus. According to the regulations, parking funds can only be used for parking and they can only be rolled forward for three years. So we have a three-year pot already brimming with cash. There is absolutely no reason why this council couldn't have resurfaced every car park, could have increased the parking team and could have subsidised and improved the park and ride service. The reason that this council didn't was a political choice. Now, I'm delighted to hear that you're finally listening to the bid and to the businesses and to the residents. I'm delighted that there are discussions between those that represent businesses and that you are revising those proposals. It's absolutely essential that we use the funds from parking to increase public transport. That is the only way that you will move people out of cars and into buses. You can't do it backwards. I'm delighted that we've heard today from the businesses they shouldn't have had to fill in a petition in order to have the right to speak on this topic. There should have been a consultation with our stakeholders from the outset. Please, going forward, can we make sure that we work in partnership with key stakeholders in the town and in the county when we are developing proposals that will affect them? Thank you. Thank you. Right. I've got a few people sticking their hands up. Um, I can't take everybody because we are restricted 15 minutes. Roger has um, very nicely kept the time clock or set it for us. Um, Councillor Hilary Luff, and then if there's, I've got to bring the portfolio holder back too. So, Hilary. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to say that I and my family nearly always use the park and ride to go into town. We find it incredibly helpful, really useful, and on time. I've just checked, it's open from 7.30 till 6.10. I've I got to admit, I don't use it to go into work there. So I don't know if it actually goes from 7.30, but it's definitely there for me to go in and do my shopping. I actually spend more time in Shrewsbury because I'm using the park and ride, because I'm not worrying about how long I've got to park my car for. We should be encouraging people to use park and ride far, far more. It's far greener, far better that we keep the traffic out of town. So I'm actually really strongly saying that we should be promoting park and ride thank you now we've got a couple of minutes left <laughs> literally a couple of minutes so i'm going to if, if you uh, can take a minute because i've got to bring the portfolio holder back to, to give us what we're going to be voting on um and i think there's three minutes left in this debate so briefly yeah thank you just to mention on the park and ride to run in tandem with this the park and ride service uh, from the 1st of April will be reduced to half price, so that's one pound. Um, so the park and ride service will also run every 20 minutes from 7 o'clock, 20 past 7, 20 to 8, through till 9 o'clock on those 20 minutes to give, and likewise for the end of the day, to give people who work in the centre of Shrewsbury that opportunity to use that very cheap uh, parking facility. Thank you. Thank you. Right. What about a minute and a half left, so I'm going to bring back Councillor Dan Morris. I don't want you to answer questions or anything else. You have the petition in front of you. There are a range of choices. You need to give us guidance on what you're recommending that we take as a choice so that we can vote on it. Thank you, Chair. Um, we will be writing, um, writing out the view of the um, of the council and setting them out um, to the petitioners uh, officially. I confirm that we are taking this back to cabinet. Um, options are being looked at, including nighttime 
parking, nighttime parking, including Sunday parking, and including looking at areas outside of the loop where um, things may be tweaked. But those are all being looked at. I have to pick up Councillor Buckley on a couple of things. Um, first of all, I was very pleased to say that we should be using the money to invest in public transport. That's exactly what we have been doing with some of the, uh, the money, as, as you will know. Um, and also to pick her up on the fact that um, what we were doing is illegal. It isn't, and you're wrong. Thank you. Okay. Vote, please, Chair. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you can if enough of you want to do it. We don't I could have a vote. do it. I don't know if there is a vote, is there? We don't have a vote on a petition. You do, you do have a. You have, a, you have to agree what council is going to do. So this yeah. is a, the we motion do. is to, as Dan has just said. Right. <coughs> so. What am I Hold on, there's a hubbub of noise, if you can just be careful for a second. Dan Quiet, sorry. We will write back to the petitioner. Yes. That's the decision. But we have to know that, 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 that there are a range of decisions that can be taken, and that's the one. That's what is okay. proposed. Okay. So the proposal is from the portfolio holder that we write back to the uh, petitioner. Does that sum it up, or? Yes. Yeah. Um, Julia has asked for a recorded vote on whether a letter should be sent or not. Um, so, so, so we'll, we'll, so we'll, we'll vote on that. There are a range of decisions to be fair. So, okay. So, Chief Executive. Apropos that, Mr. Speaker, is it possible to move an amendment to the cabinet holders, uh, no. to the portfolio holders' no, report? No, petition. And there are a range of things, and we are moving to the vote, Alan. Roy Allcroft. Four. Yeah. Four. Uh, no, well, but, 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 yeah. <coughs> Leslie, this, this is what we're doing. We're going to move through it. Chief Executive. Jeff Anderson. Four. Caroline Bagnall. Four. <laughs> right, please. Nicholas Bardsley. Four. Doyce Barrow. Bernie Bentick. Abstain. Thomas Biggins. Four. Edward Bird. Four. Peter Broomhall. Four. Julia Buckley. Barry Burchard. Four. Bellum Butler. Four. Dean Carroll. Four. Steve Charmley. Four. Rachel Connolly. Gerald Dakin. Four. Steve Davenport. Four. Mary Davis. Against. Jeff Elner. Four. David Evans. Julia Evans. Against. Roger Evans. Abstain. Paul Gill. Four. Rob Gittins. Four. Nat Green. Against. Kate Halliday. Against. Simon Harris. Four. Nigel Hartin. Against. Nick Hignett. Four. Ruth Houghton. Against. Richard Huffer. Sorry. Tracy Huffer. Against. Vince Hunt. Four. Kirsty Hurst Knight. Four. Mark Jones. Four. Simon Jones. Four. Duncan Kerr. Against. Heather Kidd. Against. Christian Lee. Four. Hilary Luff. Four. Nigel Lumby. Four. Robert Macy. Four. David Minery. Anne Morris. Four. Pam Mosley. Against. Alan Mosley. Against. Cecilia Motley. Four. Peggy Mullock. Four. Ian Nellins. Four. Kevin Pardy. Against. Viv Parry. Against. 
Tony Parsons. Against. Leslie Picton. For. John Price. Chris Schofield. For. Andrew Sherrington. Against. Colin Taylor. Dan Thomas. For. Edward Towers. Against. Kevin Turley. For. David Vasma. Against. Alex Wagner. Against. Claire Wilde. For. Brian Williams. For. Mark Williams. Against. Rob Wilson. Against. Paul Wynn. For. Thank you. Okay. Okay. We have the results of the um, recorded vote. Uh, I have to say it's a bit bizarre that we've had a recorded vote on that, but um, there we go, as requested. There are 38 councillors for sending a letter, 22 councillors against sending a letter, and two councillors who abstained, so weren't sure, I guess, whether one should be sent or not. So you will be getting a letter from the portfolio holder. Chair, on a point of clarification, I wasn't actually against sending a letter, as long as that letter says, yes, we agree to your petition and will stop yep. the increase in charges. That's, it's, that's, quite, it's quite inappropriate to um, refer to the decisions made here and the way in which you did. I voted against sending a letter because it wasn't doing what it was, I intended it to. Right. Alan, thank you. I, I, I believe the portfolio outlined what was the content of the letter would be, um, and um, that's up to him, and that's what we were voting on. What were the other so, options, then? We usually have those Alan. printed. We will move on to item six, which is the establishment of the Children's Improvement Board. I'm going to invite Councillor Kirsty Hurst-Knight, the portfolio holder for Children and Education, to present the report and move the report and recommendation that can be received and agreed. Kirsty. Thank you, Chair. Members will no doubt be aware of the Cross-Party Children's Improvement Board set up voluntarily following an Ofsted focus visit in November 2023. Because the Ofsted report was only published in January of, the, of this year, this is the first council where we could constitutionally establish the board so that it could be itemised in part three of the constitution, statutory and advisory bodies. Cabinet last week approved the Children's Improvement Plan and the board will be responsible for overseeing its implementation. It is not envisaged that it will be a permanent part of the constitution, but it will be in place as long as it's warranted and, as part it, and it, today we look to include it into the Constitution. You're being asked to agree its terms of reference, which has been approved by members of the Children's Improvement Board and are included as an appendix. The Children's Improvement Board has already met on a number of occasions and has had very good cross-party debates on issues raised, um, and concerns raised by Ofsted. And I wish to thank all board members for their contributions to date. I hope this is a non-controversial report which will receive unanimous support and I move the recommendations as in paragraph three. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I believe, Peggy, are yes, you? Yes, I'd like to second. Councillor Mullock is seconding that. Thank you. I've had Ruth Houghton indicate. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to comment on the, the work of the Improvement Board, which um, has been uh, detailed. And I do think it would be helpful if the portfolio holder could <gasps> share 
with the um, director for Adults for, for People um, a member briefing about the actual improvement plan itself and the actions within that plan. Because this, I absolutely agree that the terms of reference need to come here for approval. But the, um, the plan behind that is where the actions and the activity are taking place. Thank, Thank you. you. I've got Councillor Viv Perry and then Duncan Kerr. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm all, all for this uh, Children's Improvement Board. Um, I was quite astounded, actually, that there, on 6.3 it says, Shropshire is largely already aware of concerns, having identified them within a pre-visit self-assessment. Uh, surely uh, we, as a scrutiny board, should have had this before January. I know that, uh, that the Ofsted people came in November, but if we'd have been aware of all these things that were going on, um, I know we have a recruitment problem that was made obvious on, in January, uh, but to be told by someone after the meeting that it's not Shropshire Council's fault, this is the NHS's fault. Now, I'm sorry, that's completely wrong. Um, and I, I was taken aback, let's put it that way, when I was addressed and told that. Um, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't go through all these problems if we, as a council, were made aware of things before things happen. And this was a very bad Ofsted. Um, it was quite obvious that the, the, we, we have a real big problem. So I would like to have our scrutiny meetings before we get bad judgments, not after the act. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Duncan Kerr. Yeah, um, as a member of the board, I'd love to be able to support this paper, but unfortunately I find myself unable to do so because it falls short of what it needs to, what it needs to address. Um, this is a very serious situation. Uh, if you read the words of Ofsted, and as members of the council, we have responsibility for this, there has been a deterioration in the quality of social work practice for those children subject to child protection plans. There are serious and widespread systemic failings leading to weaknesses in child protection practice, which leave children at risk of inadequate protection and significant harm. There's nothing that the council does which can be more important than safeguarding children, and these words must be of the utmost concern, not just to the leader and portfolio holder and those who work in the service, but to every single member of this council. Because of that, we need a board representing all the relevant parties, not just some of them. We ask our social workers to pay close attention to the detail, and we also need to do the same when reviewing their service. People who study why social workers sometimes fail, and we all know about those high-profile cases, have diagnosed what they call optimism bias. It comes from forming an over-reliance on, over on relationships and failing to give due weight to conflict opinions, which leads to a prejudgment that things really aren't that serious. It's a it's a not a significant problem. If you look at terms of references for these boards up and down the county, as I have done, you'll be hard put to find any that don't involve other agencies, especially statutory partners, police and health. That's not surprising. Government advice, most recently restated in Working Together to Safeguard Children 2023, makes interagency joint work an integral at both operational and strategic level. No social worker would ever dream of completing an assessment without involving key partners, so why aren't we doing that at the strategic level as well? At the board meetings already held, social work managers have shared concerns in this regard. Strategy agencies also work with other councils so can contribute experiences and insight that could help us on our improvement journey. They can't do that if they're not there. <laughs> this omission is further exacerbated by the continual refusal to involve the chair of the people who review and scrutiny committee. You would think if we took serious scrutiny seriously, she would be the first person to be named and involved in the board. I've raised this quite a few times, actually, um, before, and I received an assurance that she would be invited. But lo and behold, when I see the terms of reference before us today, that post is entirely missing from the core attendee schedule, uh, not the attention to detail we need. Four non-administration members have given up their time to join the board, and I thank colleagues for this, but none of the, none 
of them have the delegated powers given by this council to members of the cabinet and no one else from the cabinet has joined a portfolio holder to assist her in um, dealing with this difficult and complex area. The board has heard a key number of problems has, has been the recruiting and retaining social workers, leading to reliance on agency staff. The remuneration and consideration of market supplements requires input from the portfolio holder for resources and HR. At the last board meeting, we couldn't even get the most crucial piece of data on caseloads per social worker due to an IT issue. If the portfolio holder for IT had been there, we might have been able to resolve the matter. So in short, we have some, but not all the relevant people on the board. In addition, after five months, the board is still not receiving, let alone appraising, the key data on caseloads as it's needed to provide reassurance. So I will be abstaining and urge the controlling group to amend going forward the membership of this board to include statutory partners. I just words fail me as to why you would not do so. Look at any board across the county and you'll find they are there. The children of Shropshire deserve nothing less. Thank you. Councillor Julia Buckley. <coughs> I just want to endorse what um, Councillor Duncan Kerr has, has said, and I believe his own professional background is in this sphere, and I think that he's bringing quite a lot of knowledge and experience both to the debate and to the board. All of us in this room, as corporate parents, therefore individually responsible, should be very concerned about the state of looked after children and about this report. I frequently raise the fact that we have a ra rising number of looked after children in Shropshire, statistics which are not mirrored across the county. I was pulled up on it at the last meeting and I was told that my statistics were incorrect. So I'd like to read to you from the LGA website the rate of looked after children per 10,000 children under the age of 18. In the year 2018, 2017 to 18 in Shropshire, the average number was 57. In the year 22 to 23, that had almost doubled to 111. The mean average for all English unitary authorities, so that's authorities that represent uh, rural counties like ours, in the same period went from 77 to 86. So can you see that our numbers have nearly doubled and other comparable authorities have only risen by 10%? We should be very concerned, not only by the numbers, but by the very serious issues that are being raised in this service. As opposition members, for two years running in our alternative budget, we asked you to stop paying agency workers to increase the salary and the conditions of your social workers so we could have continuity of care. When Ofsted came in, that was their number one urgent instruction to you to do so. I don't expect any of you here to listen to me. You'll tell me I'm being political. But I think that you should listen to Ofsted. And I think we should also listen to Duncan Kerr, who's bringing his experience. And with your permission, Duncan, and with yours, Peggy, I'd like to bring forward an amendment which includes the chair of the children's panel on this board. Do you accept that amendment? Just to clarify, she is going to be a member of the board. She missed last one because of a panel meeting, but she's a member. All right, she's sorry. No, Julia, please, I am speaking. And when I speak, please be quiet. First of all, we're not in here for individual debates. Anything that is discussed will be done through the chair. Now, I am, will allow Kirsty to answer that, because my understanding is that what you are proposing an amendment is already happening, but... There you go. Kirsty? Thank you, Chair. Yes, she is a member of the board now. There you go. Then, then, no, no. So my amendment is that it be added to the document. So if the document is incorrect and missing something, <coughs> could it therefore be added for clarity? We can add that. Sorry? Yep. Happy to do that is what I'm being told. Thank you very much. Have you finished? Good. Okay. I've got Councillor Claire Wilde, then Councillor Leslie Picton. Oh, sorry, Heather Kidd first, sorry. And then Claire Wilde. You're quite right, Heather. I apologise. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's not like you. Um, <laughs> I have a number of things to say about this, and I do think that actually scrutiny had a role earlier on, and it was a risk, and it wasn't a risk that was flagged up to us. But we are where we are. And actually, sometimes... Uh, we need to look to the future rather than what's gone wrong 
it did go wrong, but I hope that in future we are beginning to look at all those risks so that we don't get here, or at least when we do get here, the whole chamber isn't really surprised. So, I think Ruth is right in that we do all need a briefing because we are the statutory, uh, we are statutorily uh, parents to these children across the county, so it's really important for all of us. I do think that this board being cross-party and being put in place as when it was is a vital thing. This is not something that has to be political. It must not be political, which is why I do think that we should be brave enough to flag up those risks in advance, because they will have been known. We are all overworked. All of our staff are overworked and are likely to get to be more overworked. So the more that councillors can be in the loop of the problems we are having, because they are across the country, they're not just us, the more we can look at that and try to find ways around that in advance of an Ofsted, then the better it will be. But I completely support a cross-party board because it's really important we all sing from the same hymn sheet for the sake of the children that are in our care. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Claire Wilde. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd like to agree with the points that Heather made there. Um, you know, this isn't political. Uh, and, and I do think it's the wrong place to have this kind of debate. We should never politicise our children. The people on the committee work so hard, and, and I, I, just, I just feel that, you know, the, the establishment of this Children's Improvement Board is so important. Uh, and for those who, who sort of want to make political capital out of it, shame on you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Leslie Picton. Leslie. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, a few things, really. One, um, just to respond to some of the people that have talked about scrutiny, including Biv and, and to Heather, um, we absolutely would have taken that to the scrutiny panel, but it was embargoed and we weren't able to. So, OK, fine. Um, but, you know, I, I just want to make that point clear because it's something that absolutely we wouldn't keep away from um, scrutiny. That's what you're there for. Um, you know, Ofsted have told us that they would like us to get rid of all our agency staff. I can tell you now they've told every other council that in the West Midlands. The simple fact is we have to work with what we have and we are trying our very best. I am absolutely delighted and for those of you who don't know, the first thing that was agreed about this Children's Improvement Board was cross-party support because there are people on that board, um, Councillor Kirby and one of them, Councillor Parsons, um, and, and Councillor Houghton, who um, we knew right from the start that we needed everybody's heads together on this one. So that cross-party support is really important. Personally, I don't have a problem with bringing in external partners. Um, to just vaguely respond to you, Viv, and I don't mean to do this in a... Uh, I think that the difficulties we have is that we are not solely in charge of our destiny when it comes to some of the actions they are down also to the NHS, and that's where we do have, have an issue. I don't, Thank you, Viv. don't need to Viv, respond to Viv. Viv. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, but what I, you know, I don't personally have a problem with looking at what external partners come in. I think, Duncan, the place to have brought this up was actually at the board, not today, because this is actually about setting the board in the constitution, which I think is really important. So I'll shut up now. OK. Peggy, you reserved your right. Hello. Sorry, can you use your microphone? Oh, sorry. Maybe? Anybody that's on our scrutiny knows no politics doesn't come into it. Care of our children's what's matter. And when D Duncan talked about outside partners, we very often bring outside partners in to answer for us to question them. I'm sorry, I haven't been to a board meeting yet, so I can't answer much about it. I'll be doing my first one next week. Kirsty, Good. do you want to? Okay, Kirsty. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Quite a lot of points have uh, been mentioned a few times, so apologies if I don't respond to individual councillors by name. Absolutely, there is a members' briefing planned, and information will go onto the portal, especially for following some inaccuracies from Cabinet last week. 
Um, yes, the board will report and regular updates to scrutiny as planned. Um, that's already planned. Cabinet will have also be informed of all progress. Um, just to talk about cross-party, it was absolutely something that the leader and I wanted, and we specifically wanted the people that I was allowed to pick onto that board through the LGA support because of their knowledge and commitment and the way they challenge, along with Councillor Minnery, who wasn't mentioned. We have a really good chance at this because of the cross-political challenge and support of our officers. We've got to remember 85% of children that come into our care are court-ordered. And it's absolutely the right thing for us to do to look after these children. So it's operational matters are important to us. We have absolutely the right chair. I don't know why this is an issue of the membership. So please support this, mo um, support this paper today because we need to get this onto the constitution and get on with the work that we've got planned. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So there is a recommendation. We are being asked to approve the formal establishment of the Children's Improvement Board. Uh, with the terms of reference as set out in Appendix 1, with the additional name added as requested. All those in favour, please show. Against? Abstentions, Duncan. Two. Two abstentions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we will move on, therefore, to the next item which is the Senior Officer Employment Procedure. I'm going to invite Councillor Gwilym Butler, the Portfolio Holder for Finance, Corporate Resources and, community, and Communities, to present the report, move the report and recommendations that they may be received and agreed. Gwilym. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Chairman. It's Councillor Gwilym Butler, Portfolio Holder for Finance, Corporate Resources and Communities. Members, this is a, a piece of um, housekeeping. Following a review of the standing order and associated procedure last year, aligning to best practice, the report asked the Council to approve an updated procedure for the employment, the employment of senior officers. The updated procedure clarifies the definitions of different types of senior officers, covers recruitment, grievances, disciplinary, disciplinary action and dismissal and establishes a chief officer employment panel. The updated procedure aligns with the Shropshire Plan priority of having a healthy organisation, provides confidence in the organisation's <coughs> reputation as an employer of choice, and complies with the legal requirements for the appointment and dismissal of statutory officers. The report recommends that the Council adopt the proposed procedure and establish the Chief Officer Employment Panel and delegate the power to make minor amendments to the Assistant Director for Workforce and Improvement. The key points are effectively the general principles of staff employment, the definition of chief officers and independent panels, appointment of the head of paid service, appointment of other chief officers, employment responsibilities of non-chief officers and the disciplinary action and dismissal of senior officers. No, nothing else to say, Chair, and I move the recommendations as set out in item three. Thank you. Thank you very much. I understand that's being seconded by... Happy to second, uh, Chair. OK. I think, as Gwilym said, it's a piece of housekeeping, really, so... Can't see any... Oh, Julia. Sorry, your hand was behind. Thank you. I'm, I'm struggling to understand why you've brought this today. Um, we have existing um, conditions for all staff uh, in this Council, and we have existing processes and protocols that have been agreed with our trade unions. Any change for any officers of any level would normally go through the policy forum and then to the EJCC, which I believe has a constitutional requirement. This paper today has gone through neither of those processes, so it feels like a rather rushed, urgent document, and we're wondering why you would want to do it. I'd like you to answer two questions, please. One, if this were to go through, what would be different about how the last chief executive was dismissed compared to what would happen under this process? And secondly, you talk about wanting to avoid a legal challenge. I think that if you do wish to avoid legal challenge, this needs to be deferred today until it has been through the policy forum and the EJCC Constitutional Committee. Okay. I've got no other hands, so Leslie, you reserved your right. Yeah, I'm not aware 
that this was going to have any impact on anything that uh, the Labour office, uh, the Labour leader has just uh, had comments on. I will. I'd like. Can I just um, take some advice on that, Mr. Collard? Well, I, I know the, uh, the the council's chief um, personnel officer, Sam Williams, was, was heavily involved in this, and I, I, I can't comment in great detail as to whether she's um, made an error, but uh, she was perfectly comfortable that this was the appropriate place to bring this item. Gwilym. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, it is not the time or place to actually talk about individual cases um, of historical uh, personnel of this council. Again, as um, the monitoring officer Tim Collard has stated, I would doubt very much that Sam Williams would have brought anything forward to the council um, outside her usual open door access, as I have, to the unions as well. Um, with that in end, um, I would move the recommendations of the report. I will take back Councillor Buckley's comments. Um, and should I need to bring it back again, I will. But I think it should be moved today as it stands. Thank you. No, well, thank you for that. Um, I think Julia has raised a, an interesting question. Um, an answer would be quicker getting here, perhaps by carrier pigeon, than it would be. So what I'm going to propose with members OK is that we actually defer this item to the end of the meeting and come back to it so that the appropriate advi advice can be sought and we can do it properly. I is everybody happy with that? I don't really want to take a vote on it and record it one or otherwise, but if everybody's happy, we will move item seven then and take it as the last agenda item. So we'll move on to item eight then, which is, are you happy with that? Sorry, portfolio holder? Yeah. yeah, all right. We'll move on to item eight then, which is the community governance review. And I'm going to invite Councillor Gwilym Butler again Oh, sorry, I thought Leslie, Leslie was talking to me. I'm going to invite Councillor Gwynn and Butler, the portfolio holder, again to uh, present the report, move the report, and the recommendations be received and agreed. Gwynn. Um Thank you, Mr Chairman. Councillor Gwynn Butler, um, Cabinet Member for Finance, um, Corporate Resources and Communities. Members will remember back in the autumn, we bought the first uh, paper regarding this to actually go out to the town and parish councils of the affected areas where the boundary changes had taken place for their thoughts and uh, opinions of how the wards or changes or no changes should take place. We have listened to all those involved. We have had the cross-party working group look at the responses. Effectively, we have not changed any of those responses that have come back, and we are effectively doing what the communities actually want us to do. The paper in front of you actually asks us now to go out for formal consultation to say these are the changes we're going to make and that process will go through the normal time so we can get these changes made um, for the uh, next elections in May 25. We are on quite a strict timetable um, and I am disappointed as other members in this chamber that we do not have the capacity to do any other parishes at this time outside those that we need to do due to the boundary changes. Um, that we've already seen. No, nothing else to say, Chair. I just move the recommendations in the report. Thank you. Right. Councillor Nick Barnes, yeah, I think you're second. Second there, and you? reserve my right, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Well, I've had two councillors indicate so far Councillor Tony Parsons and Councillor Claire Wilde. Councillor Parsons. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I'd like to uh, strongly support uh, these, this uh, proposal. Uh, it affects, uh, in particular, my my ward, and, and it's a sensible proposal. It uh, makes the outline of uh, Shrewsbury a uh, far more distinguishable one by m major highways rather than fences in fields, and uh, it, it, is, it makes absolute sense and uh, we'll be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wild. Thank you. Just to uh, echo Councillor Parsons' comments, I think um, we've all worked well together, and certainly the, the changes that are proposed that affect me and uh, Rosebury Dartnell's division are um, sensible. So thank you. Thank you very much. 
Councillor Pardsley, you got anything you want Thank to say? Thank you, Chair. Um, just to add a little bit to what um, uh, the Chair of the Working Group said, uh, I know how disappointed many town and parish councils um, are that their carefully worked out proposals have had to be put on ice for the time being. It is very frustrating um, and the delays in dealing with the Community Governance Review are not down to this council but to the um, lengthy process um, adopted to establish the new electoral divisions for Shropshire Council. Um, and it's obviously frustrating but hopefully the new Shropshire Council elected in May next year and the Town and Parish Councils elected at the same time will look at some of the much more detailed work that's been undertaken by um, Parish Councils and indeed others in the community um, not long after May 2025. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Gwilym, you did say you didn't have anything else to say. Is there anything you wish to add to those endorsements? Not no. All. Thank you. Okay. Um, the recommendation is that the um, community governance review is set out in page 15 be approved for consultation. Um, do I need to take a vote on this? Well, yes. I think everybody. I think just put your hand up if you agree that we should do that. I think that's probably unanimous. Any against or abstentions? No. Okay, unanimous. Okay, we will move on to item nine, which is the adoption of the Clibbury Mortimer Neighbourhood Development Plan. I want to invite Councillor Chris Schofield as the portfolio holder for planning and regulatory service to present the report and move that the report and recommendations be received and agreed. Yeah, thank you, Chair. The clear Clearbury Mortimer Neighbourhood Development Plan has been produced by the Clearbury Mortimer Neighbourhood Plan Steering Group with the Clearbury Mortimer Town Council as the qualifying body. Work on the neighbourhood plan began in 2017 and has been produced in, court in, in accordance with the Neighbourhood Planning Regulations 2012. The plan has also been prepared in accordance with the Council's current de development plan and the emerging local plan. The final draft plan was submitted to an independence examiner in June 2023. Following the examination, the Clearbury Mortimer Neighbourhood Development Plan was brought to local referendum on the 7th of December 2023. The result was of those who voted, 84.21% <coughs> were in favour of Shropshire Council using the neighbourhood plan for Clearbury Mortimer to help it decide planning applications in the neighbourhood area. As such, the recommendation is that Shropshire Council, as the local planning authority, i.e. adopts the Clearbury Mortimer Neighbourhood Plan, as set out in Appendix 1 to the report, and brings it into force with immediate effect as part of the development plan for Shropshire. And I would just like to thank all those involved for all their very hard work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I believe that's being seconded by Councillor Simon Harris. Do you wish to say something <coughs> now? Or um, just very briefly, Chair, um, I'd just like to recommend this, uh, the adoption of this plan. Um, this is my division alongside Gwilym Butler, Councillor Butler, and I'd like to pay tribute to the volunteers, and they were volunteers, and the Town Council. I don't know why this is hissing, actually. But, and, and the Town Council, who have worked really hard at putting this together without pay um, for, well, I think, for about the last seven years. So. I'll stop now and just recommend this, um, the adoption of this plan to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Butler. Yeah, as the fellow um, local member, again, I um, support the recommendations of, to adopt this. Um, I've worked with the team over the years um, and uh, attended the open meetings to explain to the public and have also acted as the conduit between the team and Shropshire Council. I'd personally like to thank the chair of that team, Peter Blackburn, who has worked tirelessly on getting this forward. And I'd like to thank him very much and um, you know, support the recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Well, I've had nobody else indicate. Um, all those, uh, please show in favour of adopting. Any against? Abstentions? Unanimous. Thank you, councillors.
We are going to move on to item 10. There were a few folks who are now leaving the room who uh, expressed interest. Item 10 then, they've now left, is the Shrews, Shrewsbury Town Centre Regeneration Spithfield River Phase 1 Development Activities. I'm going to invite Councillor Ian Nellins, the Deputy Leader and Portfolio of Climate Change and Environment Transport, present the report and move that the report and the recommendations be received and agreed. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Ian Nellins, Deputy Leader. This report is to seek approval for the proposed development activities for the Smithfield Riverside Phase 1 Regeneration Programme including the approval to progress capital projects to meet the obligations of the Leveling Up Fund Round 2 grant for Shrewsbury, which was awarded in January 2023. Uh, the Shrewsbury Town Centre Redevelopment is an ambitious regenerative initiative supporting a healthy economy, promoting the county town as a safe, strong, vibrant destination to visit and invest, a healthy environment and organisation through the potential for low carbon development, mitigating climate change, increasing flood resilience, whilst reducing the Council's operational carbon footprint and providing green space in our public realm. Consultations have been held on the initial phases for the initial planning application to demolish the former Riverside Shopping Centre and construct parkland and meanwhile green space. The outcomes of this consultation, including focused engagement with key stakeholders such as the Environment Agency and Historic England, have supported this submission for the planning application this application was submitted, and on the 5th of March 2024, there was a unanimous resolution to grant planning permission subject to conditions. This report also seeks approval to progress the works associated with the Loft 2 grant toward award for transforming movement and public space in Shrewsbury as a capital project. There is a need to progress potential opportunities and assess the demand for a new cinema in the Smithfield Riverside area and to undertake soft market testing with hotel operators and developers. Uh, this report also seeks approval to progress the associated negotiations and engagement activities necessary to assess these needs. And it's proposed that this will be led by the development manager, Ravine Hart, already commissioned to support the Smithfield Riverside project. I move the recommendations at paragraph three, that's 3.1 through 3.2.2. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that's being seconded by Councillor Gary Birchett, is that correct? Thank you, Mr Chairman, uh, and I reserve my right. Okay. Councillor Matt Green has indicated now. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> right, let's just unpick these things a little bit. Um, I fully support the principle of the redevelopment of the Riverside, uh, and, and I think that the, uh, the ideas, or while there are still other parts of, the, um, uh, of it, are still up in the air, but the initial one, which is to do with the redevelopment of Rouse Hill, I think is extremely good, and I support that. However, I'm actually talking about what is referred to in this, uh, in, in this report as Appendix E. Whereas with the Riverside itself, we have a comprehensive um, uh, engagement with the public, uh, it was comp and impressive, really, if you, if the, the scale and size of the, of the um, public engagement. When we come on to the, um, the gyratory scheme, the, it, there's nothing like that. In fact, the residents of uh, Chester Street, who are, um, believe it or not, is actually one of the most densely populated parts of Shrewsbury and indeed the county, feel angry and um, perplexed at the way that they have been treated. They were given a barely one month uh, engagement period. That engagement period has not even reported yet. In fact, I, 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 I read from an email sent yesterday. The intention is to publish the consultation results in the next two weeks and ensure that a copy of the report will be also addressed. Some of the air quality and pollution queries that have been raised will be available to you. How can this council vote on the Chester Street development when the public consultation has not even reported yet? How can, we, how can we look our residents in the eye when they are not being treated, um, given the same level of, um, of consultation um, support, as it were, that were given to those who were responding to the, the Riverside? And I think it is absolutely imperative that this council um, should 
I think um, on that basis, we should be looking to have, uh, well, I would move a deferral of um, Appendix E until we actually have the information in front of us and until we know that the, the, uh, the residents involved have, have actually been, uh, can actually feel that they have been part of the process. So, um, so, Chair, I would like to move an amendment that Appendix E is deferred until a time at which we can actually um, uh, talk about it competently. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a seconder for that. Alex. Okay. Can I go straight to that one? Did, did you want to, did you, did anybody want to speak to that at all, or Alex? Are you content just to move to the vote? I'm, I'm happy to move to the vote on deferring it. Well, I think the proposer has commented on it, Tom. All right. Okay. Chris. It was Ian, sorry. There you go. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I don't agree that the, an amendment is requir required at this stage. Um, there has been consultation for a four-week period, and officers are engaging and have are, are arranging to meet with Chester Street residents um, to alleviate their, their fears at this time. So I, I would not support the amendment. Thank you. Okay. Well, we've got an amendment that's been uh, tabled and seconded. Um, you've heard from the portfolio holder. <coughs> Um, all those in favour of an amendment, please show. Those against, please show. Keep your hands up for long enough for officers to count, please. Extensions. One. So that's uh, 25 for deferral, 33 against deferral, and one abstention. So we will continue with the debate. And I've got Councillor Mark Jones. <coughs> now, can you just turn your microphone off, please? Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, a visionary plan for Shrewsbury. That one. It's a visionary plan for Shrewsbury. It's a cunning plan. If you put a tail on it, we could call it a weasel. And I think um, Tim Pritchard has done a fantastic job to keep moving this forward. Um, we've, uh, as we've consulted on a lot of things with this, and as you visualise coming over the Riverside Bridge um, that you walk on a pond now, um, you'll see lovely Rice Hill, uh, a lovely green park area there that will be a, a real asset to Shrewsbury. And I think in the future, Shrewsbury is going to become a fantastic town, which it is already, but it's going to become even better with the levelling up fund that we've got. And then when we move Shire Hall down there to the multi-agency the multi hub, it's going to transform us. And I think we'll need all the parking we can get in Shrewsbury because I think people weren't wanting to visit Shrewsbury for a long, long time. And I hope that maybe in the future that our children who are going off to other cities and other towns to work and live will start to think about using Shrewsbury as a centre of their lives so that we can keep our children in Shropshire and make them employable in Shropshire. So I think this plan needs adopting as soon as we can. Thank you. Roger. I was watching you because I thought you'd put your hand up. You like to do it just as I'm thinking we're through it. No. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> I'm conscious that there are other members in the chamber and they may want to come in, so I don't put it up immediately. I'm interested in hearing the debate and contemplating what is actually said. But 
However, the group over this side are in favour of redevelopment, redevelopment of the town centre. It is an important step for the county town of Shrewsbury. However, every household, especially in these times, knows that you do not contemplate knocking down part of your home and rebuilding when you're broke. The council is now attempting to borrow even more money to employ even more consultants to draw up a scheme when there is a £62 million black hole caused by some by government but also by the antics of the Conservative administration in the last years since the unitary was formed. 2009 through that and we had £80 million in uh, extended reserves, we had general reserves and this year, this current year, we're predicted to be £1.6 million and that's only attained by cancelling 800,000 spend on roads. And here we are contemplating spending more money when, as Councillor Green, who represents that area, has said, there is a consultation still out. It's time, really, for the Conservative administration to be grown up. Grow up and cut their cloths according to their budget. We would look at alternative delivery methods that could include spreading any spend to Shrewsbury and also share it around the other cash-starved towns in Shropshire. It is important, the regeneration of Shrewsbury. There is already agreement to do that start, and we fully support that. But this effort now to borrow even more money to employ even more consultants, no, we don't. We will abstain from this because part of it we support, as I have said, about the regeneration around Smithfield and the already agreement, but the other part of this, we don't. So we can't really support it and we can't really vote against it because of the way it is written. But please, will the administration who are in charge, maybe, depending on any by-elections until May 25, look at how they're continuing to spend the assets, the money that this council has because next year may be even harder than it is this year. We are losing staff. We're asking real dedicated staff to volunteer for a redundancy, and if they don't, they will be made redundant. We've got de departments, denuded of Ro staff. Roger, can we, can we stick to the agenda item, please, instead of having Tis a party for this because it's spending Roger, money. can we stick to the item, please? Well, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. But really, the agenda here is to borrow, spend more money on consultants. We're already spending millions already. This is too far. We will be abstaining from this. Thank you, Roger. Councillor Dan Morris, then Councillor Alex Wagner, then Councillor Dean Carroll. Dan. I'd like to fully associate myself with the comments of Councillor Jones. It's a very exciting um, prospect having this done. I'd like to congratulate the officers for their bid for the levelling up fund and I'd also like to put on comment my, um, on record my appreciation for the MP for Shrewsbury who's fought so successfully for this money as well. Um, I, I assume that Councillor Evans um, by either neither supporting or voting against it, typical Liberal fair really sitting on the fence, um, I, you know, it, it, I presume you just want to see the town fall into managed decline, do you Roger? I mean that's just that's purely right. what you're saying, isn't it? Just Point of order, order no. Mr. Chairman. I no. did not say that, and words have Roger, been reputed. Roger, Roger, I'm in the chair. I will run the meeting, but thank you for your advice. I, Councillor Morris, can we stay away from, from personal insults, please, or party political I, I insults? I wouldn't have said that was a personal insult. Thank you. Right. That was, that was I, a well, I'm not going to debate it with you either, which Councillor which Morris. All right, I'm in the chair, and I'm making a request, and please adhere to it. Thank you. Um, I'm personally looking forward to my children growing up and seeing this town for what it's going to be, which is a beautiful place, a fantastic place to live, fit for purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Alex Wagner. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, like, like my other colleagues, I support the redevelopment of the Riverside. I think I've spoken when it was last at Council. Um, and the point I made then, and the point I've also made in my personal response to the consultation, is that uh, this project really ought to be more residential-led. Um, 
if you look not just in the town centre, but across the centre of Shrewsbury, that the, the real problems in our economy, as I mentioned earlier in this meeting, are about recruitment, they're about getting people to live in the town, getting people of working age into the town, and actually creating the sort of flats, one and two beds, more affordable properties and more central properties where perhaps you don't need use of a private car is really essential to this. The Riverside is very positive to that end, but actually the focus of it, I think, as the debate has gone on and as the consultation has gone on, has understandably um, headed more and more in that direction, which is, which is a good thing. My worry about what we're looking at today is that we are essentially being asked to commit a further sum of public money when I suppose the point that I would make, and I think, as I say, the point I have made before, is that there would be ways of accessing <coughs> private money for some of the projects included as part of this. Um, ultimately, that probably would be private and residential, but then that is the need in Shrewsbury. That, that's the need for the economy, that's the need for uh, keeping younger people in the town and getting working age people in, that's the need for our NHS, for our hospitality industry, for uh, what the people at the Shrewsbury bid were mentioning earlier in the meeting. So. There's things that only the council can do and only the government can fund. Things like the levelling up fund to essentially make it a brownfield site, the Rouse Hill Park, uh, the master planning. But actually, what I would propose is that, given we're being asked to commit even further public money by voting for this, I'm not comfortable with that. And actually, I, I think we ought to be taking it down a slightly different path in light of the consultation going into the next phases, where when we look at bits of it that say home slash cinema slash office slash whatever it else it might be, I think we probably need to look at the economic warning signs and start thinking more residential and thinking more private sector. So I'm going to be abstaining on this because I, I don't personally feel comfortable voting for the further expense when I think there are decent alternatives out there. But um, I, I do that with a slightly heavy heart because I really do think that redeveloping that part of Shrewsbury is a game changer and um, I, I don't think that this is a, a bad overall plan. I just think that the report in front of us today isn't what I had hoped it would be. Thank you. Councillor Dean Carroll. Thank you, Chairman. Before I start addressing the issues in this paper, I need to challenge what Councillor Evans has said. By using the words conservative antics when he talks about the financial position of the council. He appears to be implying some kind of improper behaviour or impropriety. If he has evidence of this, he needs to present it to the authorities or otherwise withdraw the comment as it could be interpreted in a way that could bring the council into disrepute. Now, moving on to this paper. There still seems to be no understanding of the diff with some of the difference between capital and revenue expenditure. Can I suggest that those who remain confused seek additional training? I'm very disappointed with the response that this positive report has generated from across the chamber. The public consultation has shown huge public support for the ambition. And by the way, the public consultation on the gyratory system did close on the 5th of March. It's just that the feedback from that is summarised in the appendices and not included in quite so much detail as the feedback on the wider redevelopment. We are bringing millions of pounds worth of investment into Shrewsbury to regenerate the town centre. And the recommendations in this paper are the launch pad for that investment. Towns and cities across the country would welcome the kind of vision and commitment to the future vitality of the town centre that we are putting forwards. The recommendations of this report are to proceed now that we have engaged with the public and partners to make use of the levelling up funding that Shrewsbury's MP has delivered for the town in line with previous decisions made by this council and to line up commercial deals for the future consideration of both cabinet and council. In terms of the use of outside consultants and expertise, I'll borrow a comparison that was made about your house. If you were building a new house or an extension to your house, you would hire an architect, you would hire a, draft of, a draftsman, you would hire a clerk of works, you wouldn't draw the plans up yourself, you wouldn't try and draw up the drainage and the electrical schemes yourself, you would bring in the experts, and that is what we are proposing to do. There is no good reason not to back proceeding here. It's time to get off the fence. Two of the four credible parliamentary candidates for Shrewsbury are in the room today. Will they back investment in Shrewsbury? The people of Shrewsbury deserve to know the answer to that. So, Mr Chairman, I request a recorded vote. And that is... Thank you, Mr Davenport. We don't do that. 
Okay, there will be a recorded vote on this when we get to it, but there are other speakers first. I've got Councillor Kidd and Councillor Sherrington. Heather. I think um, living out in the countryside, this is our service centre as well. And actually sometimes the people of Shrewsbury forget that it's our main service centre. I'm absolutely clear in my own mind that we do need to do something substantial in the town centre and I do support most of this. My real concern here is, yes, we want to bring our young people in, but on the other hand, we don't want them doing a university degree here because that's gone. So they can go away to study, but they are requested to come in for their social life. That's all good, but I hope these plans will eventually mean that we can continue to keep our young people doing degrees here, because I have a number in my, my division who are now really thinking very carefully about their futures. So that's an aside. I do support. I think, yes, you always bring in experts. You're absolutely right, Dean. You do want somebody who knows what they're doing doing things. But when you haven't got any money, you actually put something on hold for a little while rather than borrowing the money to do it and causing extra stresses on the revenue budget, which is already stressed. That is the issue here. It's about fiscal competence, which I thought the Conservatives thought was their domain only. So far from sitting on the fence, which has never been useful in my life, and you will know that if you know me at all, I'm always quite forthright in what I believe. I am definitely not sitting on the fence over this. I agree with the scheme. I think it's absolutely worthwhile. I disagree with borrowing more money when we can't afford it. Thank you. Councillor Andrew Sherrington. Listening to this debate, I just wanted to make a couple of points on things that have been said. Uh, number one, in my book, a weasel is a nasty, vicious, pestilential rodent and not anything that we should rejoice in. I don't need to be told, and I don't think that any member of this chamber needs to be told, the difference between capital and revenue expenditure yet again. We all clearly understand what the difference is, but the thing that links them is cash. If you're going to borrow money, you have to generate the cash flow to pay it. And right now, your reserves are as near as damn it zero, so you don't have the cash in hand, which is why you're having to contemplate borrowing the money in the first place. And you're, as Heather has pointed out, you're going to stress your revenue budget by having to repay the interest on the loan, and then you're going to have to find the extra cash flow to pay down the principal. I don't see any mention of that. I don't see anything in the appendix about the project concerning that and it hasn't appeared in any of your budget proposals. This is just an excess load that doesn't need to be taken now, and is just a strain on the resources of the, the uh, council. I'm glad people really rave about the benefits of, of the project for Shrewsbury, because fr quite frankly, it does nothing for my constituents the benefits to my constituents could be etched on the head of a pin. And yet, by voting for this proposal here, we are committing them to pay for the excess load of this project. So I'm here to tell you that what will excite my constituents is the fact that, yet again, they're having to pay somebody else's bills, in particular in Shrewsbury. There are other people besides people who live in Shrewsbury. The last time I checked, the name on the outside of this building said Shropshire Council, not Shrewsbury Council. So in considering this proposal, do remember that there are people who are going to end up paying for it who are going to get the thick end of nothing as a benefit. Now, you can't be parochial. I get it. 
<laughs> what are you laughing for? A proposal is either a good proposal or it isn't. Is this a good one or not? Right, thank you. So, I will abstain on the basis that this proposal is a benefit to the people of Shrewsbury, but it doesn't have to be done now and it doesn't have to be done this way. But, remember that laughter. Because believe me, my constituents will. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Minnery, then Councillor Butler, and I think we've given this a fairly good kicking round then, so I'm going to move back to the seconder and the portfolio <coughs> holder before we move into the recorded vote. Councillor Minnery. That's you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Old age I, is I creeping up on you, is it? But I, 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 <laughs> sorry, Chair, I have a bit of a hearing problem today and I couldn't if, see If anybody else moving. is not sure when I say a name, look at the thing in front of you. <laughs> so, apologies for that. No, um, that's right. But I, I should be very brief to make up for the pause. Um, I, I, I'm not a hypocrite. I've always supported this development uh, from, from day one. I think it's a brilliant thing for Shrewsbury, brilliant thing for Shropshire. But four weeks ago, I voted against the capital strategy because I just don't agree with it. I think we are digging a hole that we, we're not going to get out of. So I can go one way or the other, and I'm going to sit on the fence, and I'm not going to apologise for that. But I just thought I'd explain to members the reason why. Thank you. Thank you. I, from what I understand from the debate, you probably won't be up there on your own, but there you go. Uh, Councillor Butler. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. I think I had to come back there. And I think what people need to think about here is the actual vision. And if we actually don't do this now, we're actually probably going to lose the, a lot of the government grant that we've actually bought into Shrewsbury, that £18 million. So by sitting on the fence and abstaining, that's actually what you're going to say, is government money needs to be spent, and there is a time limit on it. So you don't actually want that money, and we'll send it back to Westminster to, be, to go to a more, more worthy town. I would probably think, but I don't think there is a more worthy town um, sitting from this side of the chamber. And, Councillor, can you consider, picture it now, okay? Once this is actually completed and you get the new cinema, you get the eateries, you get the new apartments and all the jobs, Councillor Sheringham, how much business rates and council tax and revenue is that going to bring into this council and solve the problems? And part of that revenue will go to the adult social care and the children's services and the education of the people, not just in your ward, but all over this county. Now, Shrewsbury is one of the major places that we can actually create revenue for this county. And I fully recommend that you support these recommendations because that revenue will actually support every resident across Shropshire. Thank you. Hey, uh, no, Mr Davenport, I won't ask you not to clap again. Thank you very much. Right. Councillor Birchett, you reserved your right. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Mr Chairman, members, I'm delighted to be, able to, to be able to second this scheme. It's only through the long-term plan envisioned by the previous leader of this council that we're now in a position where we can bring this plan to members for their approval. The Smithfield Riverside project is yet another example of this Conservative administration planning for the long-term future of Shrewsbury and Shropshire, with an innovative scheme that will affect, attract millions of, in, uh, millions of pounds of inward investment into our county capital. I also want to record my thanks to the Member of Parliament for Shrewsbury, Daniel Kaczynski, for his constant lobbying of the DLUHC that led to the Smithfield Riverside project being awarded some £18.7 million in levelling up monies, not revenue, capital from government to spend on the project. This has allowed our development managers, Rivington Hark and architects Faulkner Brown, to design this excellent scheme that is before us today. Um, I'm slightly bemused that uh, the leader of the Labour group has spoken on this because uh, I received a, a communication off not long back, and uh, in it she says that um, Shrewsbury is crying out for investment. Um, 18.7 million, biggest brownfield project in the Latin decades. 
She wants investment. There's investment. Maybe she also forgot about the fully funded North West Reef Road that's being invested. Maybe she also forgot about the £312 million for the hospital that's getting done. Right. But Thank I digress. You, can, can, we, can we try I and digress. stick to, um, to um, yeah. the just... actual um, item? I digress. I do hope that she's instructed the colleagues on the left of the chamber to support this project because it's exactly what she says Shrewsbury needs. Mr Chairman, fellow members, I urge you all to vote in favour of this once in a lifetime. Uh, once in a generation project to regenerate Smithfield Riverside, and I support all the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Candy. Councillor Ellings. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for that uh, informative debate. First of all, I'd like to uh, make it clear that we're not borrowing additional money here. We're predominantly spending enough money, and it's a tight programme, and we have to engage with the private sector as well. So a full business case will come before we commit to further uh, uh, monies, which is uh, in the recommendations um, on, on the paper. Um, I sense that most people are in favour of, of the actual um, Riverside development. I understand the concerns around the gyratory. Um, the, I also understand that there's a lot of people I attended, a, a, along with some other opposition members, attended a briefing for the public reference the cycleways going through the gyratory, which uh, got a, a lot of support. From, from the public. Um, I do understand that not everything is common in alphabetical order, so to speak, but we have to get sometimes uh, G before B. But at some stage further down the line, this will all level out and come into a logical order. Um, but we are constrained by some of the financial implications and constraints that are put, put upon us. Um, but um, I just think that some people are confusing some of the issues that are coming, coming up here. Um, but unless we go forward with this, uh, we're standing still, we're going backwards, and we know what we want to see. We want to uh, have this commitment, and we want to move forward with Shrewsbury. Um, so I, I recommend this to um, all members. Thank you. OK. Uh, a recorded vote is going to be taken on this. Chief Executive. Roy Allcroft. For Jeff Anderson. Caroline Bagnall. Abstain. Nicholas Bardsley. Four. Joyce Barrow. Four. Bernie Bentick. Abstain. Thomas Biggins. Four. Edward Bird. Four. Peter Broomhall. Four. Julia Buckley. Four. Gary Burchett. Four. Gwilym Butler. Dean Carroll. Four. Steve Charmley. Four. Rachel Connolly. Abstain. Gerald Dakin. Four. Steve Davenport. Four. Mary Davis. Abstain. Jeff Elmer. Four. Julia Evans. Abstain. Roger Evans. Abstain. Paul Gill. Rob Gittins. Four. Nat Green. Abstain. Kate Halliday. Four. Simon Harris. Four. Nigel Harting. Abstain. Nick Hignett. Four. Ruth Houghton. Abstain. Richard Huffer. Tracy Huffer. Abstain. Vince Hunt. Four. Kirsty Hurst Knight. Four. Mark Jones. Four. Simon Jones. Four. Duncan Kerr. Abstain. Heather Kidd. Abstain. Christian Lee. Four. Hilary Luff. Four. Nigel Lumby. Four. Robert Macy. Four. David Minnery. Abstain. Dan Morris. Four. Pam Mosley. Four. Alan Mosley. Cecilia Motley. Four. Peggy Mullock. Four. Ian Nellins. Four. Kevin Pardy. Four. Viv Parry. Abstain. Tony Parsons. Four. Leslie Picton. Excuse me. John Price. Chris Schofield. Four. Andrew Sherrington. Abstain. 
Colin Taylor. Dan Thomas. Four. Edward Towers. Four. Kevin Turley. Against. David Vasmer. Abstain. Alex Wagner. Abstain. Claire Wilde. Excuse me. Brian Williams. Four. Mark Williams. Abstain. Rob Wilson. Abstain. Paul Wynn. Four. Thank you. Okay, just while they're adding that up, members, I understand that that has been a reply with regard to item seven. Um, so we will take that when we've done the vote on this and those that left the room have come back in. And we will start by taking that with um, the portfolio holder, I believe, has a response, giving us the response to the concern that was raised. Yes, we finished at 12.30. And we've already done most of the debate on it. It was just a question of legality. So I would imagine, Julia, it shouldn't take more than five or ten minutes, although I'm sure we can make it 45 or three hours. <laughs> As is our way. I know, but we've still got 30, 30, well, 28 minutes. I am watching the clock. As I know you are. There were loads of abstentions. Mm -hmm. There were loads of abstentions. I'm sorry about abstentions. Sorry. That is but <laughs> obviously, uh, obviously, obviously. So okay. One against. So, 39-4, 19 abstentions and one against. Sorry. So, that has passed. Thank you. So, are we? have we sent out a yes. runner? I see Claire has come back in. Viv. Sorry? They're, they're, I, I'm told by the Chief Executive that the, the um, principal lights interfere with the sound systems, which makes it virtually impossible to watch at home. So we're not saving money. We're making sure that the public and, and we can hear each other in a crystal clear fashion. So, all right. Thanks, Viv. Okay. So, as said, we're going to move back to item seven because the, um, as I say, we've already really had the debate. Um, but just so that it comes before all of the, um, well, before the reports, um, Gwilym. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not going to go through the report again, but I just have a brief statement to report following the um, clarification that was required by Councillor Buckley. This report is updating a procedure linked to the Council standing orders in the Constitution for Chief Officers. The remit of the EJCC is to approve HR policy for the National Joint Committee. This is neither. It is an amendment to procedure and is for Chief Officers, the JNC, not the NJC, and would not therefore be considered by EJCC. Following Council consideration and approval, reports such as this would be shared with the trade unions out of courtesy. And that is normal procedure. I therefore move the report as recommendations as seen in the report. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, Julia, I will allow you to... Can you, can you put your other hand up? Because Nat's quite tall in his seat and your arm's quite short. <laughs> and all I had then was a pair of fingertips. It was almost as though you were doing one of those behind him. So, Julia. Thank you. And then you. I do intend to move to the vote on this once you've said what you've said. Thank you. This is still a very unusual and rushed report. The fact that the portfolio holder had to pause the item to get advice behind the scenes from the chief officer before he could answer the question tells you that the work was not done in advance. Trade unions should have been consulted before this paper came before members. This is a major change to our staffing protocol and it is being rushed through. I wish to put forward that this be deferred until this has been consulted through the policy forum and with our trade unions so that the paper that you vote on 
you can have confidence that you will not be open to a legal challenge, which is the rationale written in to the report. So I'd like a vote, please, on a deferment. OK, is that seconded? OK, that's second and thirded. William, do you want to say anything about before I take the vote, or should I just um, go on with the vote? Yes, I think what Councillor Buckley is asking for, first of all, um, it's not rushed. It's an irrelevant question. She obviously didn't listen to my response. Um, we do not actually um, have to consult with the trade unions on this particular issue because it is not a national joint committee of which we are a member of for all the rest of the staff and we do everything by the book. So she's asking me to do something that I don't have to do, so I don't need to do it. But after, out of courtesy, just so the unions will know what's going on, because they have no um, input into this, we will talk to them afterwards. Thank you. Okay, so... Leave the report as it is. Move the recommendations, Chair. Yeah, well, we've got, we've got, a, we've got a vote on the deferment now that's, that has been proposed. But just for absolute clarity, Julia, it was not the portfolio holder who asked for a stay of execution. It was for me because I thought you had raised a, a potentially um, legal point, and it was me that put that item on hold so we could get clarification on it. We're moving to the vote now. So, there has been a proposal that we defer. All those in favour, please show. All those against, please show. Twenty-two for thirty-seven against. So we will not be deferring that item. As I said, we did give it a very good kicking through before. We paused it while we just checked the legal status of it. That has been confirmed. It is now my intention, unless Gwilym wants anything else to say, to move to the vote. Okay. So we are going to move to the vote now on item seven. There are 3.1, 3.2 and 3.3 recommendations. Uh, all those in favour, please show. I suspect it may be a mirror image of the one we've just had. No, count them, please, because it has been contentious. So. Thirty-seven four and was it twenty-two? Oh, sorry. Okay, I was asking him to look in his crystal ball. And those against, please show. Funny I'd have money on that. 22 against. Okay. Now I'm in a little bit of a quandary now because it's 10 past 12 and I suspect that the next item may take more than 20 minutes. So I think what I'm going to do is we are going to pause now and we will reconvene at 12.30 um, and finish the rest of the agenda off. If everybody's content with that, 
I think that's sensible, otherwise we'll overrun and junior level will get across with it, for the right reasons. Okay, so we're adjourned now until 12.30. Thank you, members.
decision. There was a motion, so it needed to be We can we can hash it afterwards, can't we? Okay. <laughs> Everyone take their seats, please. Are we live again? We are live again. Please be aware of that, members. And it is now my intention to um, crack on after our little bit of excitement. Item 11 is the post-16 transport task and finish group. So I'm going to invite Councillor Ian, Nell Ian Nellins, Deputy Leader and Portfolio Order for Climate Change and Environment Transport, present the report and move that the report and recommendations are received and agreed. Councillor Nellings. Uh, thank you. Uh, Post-16 Transport Task and Finish Group. This is an update report um, and the next steps. So members will be aware that at the Council, that the Council passed a motion on the 14th of December uh, that commissioned a task and finish group to look into the Council or how the Council could promote fairness and inclusivity by ensuring that all students, regardless of their economic background or location, have equal access to education without unfair financial burden or excessive transportation costs. So this paper is looking at the findings and recommendations for that task and finish group. Uh, members of the task and finish group, plus supporting officers and member observers, have already met uh, uh, the motion to work through the relevant information to understand the issues, options and confirm next steps. Um, as part of this group, consider two statutory documents, that being the travel to school for children of compulsory school age, and also the post-16 transport and travel support to education and training. Um, the group also considered the local situation in Shropshire, particularly in relation to the public transport network and how the network would look without funding support. They discussed the challenges of living in rural areas and recognised that one of the biggest challenges relating to equity of access was public transport network coverage. So the next steps and recommendations the group confirmed that the first step should be to meet the requirements of the motion. Basically, by that meant not going down rabbit holes and looking at various other things, so to stick within the focus of the motion. Um, that a one-stop shop should be considered where parents, carers, students and colleges could go to for advice, guidance and information that helps set out the options. That the passenger transport group managers should talk to enhanced bus partnership group, uh, bus providers, about the challenges, opportunities and options relating to post-16 transport. Um, a further mapping exercise should be carried out to provide a clearer understanding of current and future demand for post-16 transport, taking account small area statistics of 16 to 19 year old demographics. Work should be completed to develop and understand the likely scale and cost of the options. Um, the future findings to we have improved data connectivity with colleges should continue to be progressed. This will help to develop understanding from the data and insights that hold on where their students travel in from. The group are mindful that the next year's cohort should, will be known shortly. The Council should explore the opportunity to make available and visualised data that the Council holds and has access to identifying the potential demand in communities to indicate where the young people are in their relevant age groups in the current and future years. This might help colleges who are working to expand or target their own offers and how transport could be a feature. It could also be something that the Council could uh, provide a, a play a part in. Where there are specific issues relating to access from communities, and it is known that further education colleges are providing transport to a nearby settlement, the Council could ask the College whether they would extend their route to provide a new service where there was demonstrated demand. So this will all take a, a, a bit of work. Um, so the, the group identified uh, three main stages, short term, middle term, medium term, sorry, and long term. So the short term being the one stop shop scoping exercise, uh, potentially uh, moving to implementation. Uh, the medium term opportunities to speak to colleges and completing the data and mapping exercise for a realistic establishment of numbers and costs. And long term public transport infrastructure in Shropshire, developed, developing a more integrated transport officer, offer, sorry, making the link to the economic growth strategy. 
The group felt that the main aim should be that the short-term element of this work is underway for September 2024 for this year's cohort, or at the very latest by January 2025. So further work will continue, and that's an update. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, um, Tim has just said to me, and, and I agree, that actually this is a piece of work that was commissioned by form of a motion by this council in December. And this is just a, a report on how that's going. So technically, it doesn't need seconding. Um, I did have Kirsty Hurst tonight, the Port Children, Young People's Portfolio Holder. Kirsty, do you want to say something, but you don't actually need to second it? I won't formally second then, Chair. But yeah, I just wanted to say a thank you to everybody that was on the group. Really robust debate on how we you know, move this forward and work together, uh, cross-party representation. And as Ian said, we really focused on what we needed what we need to achieve in a short, medium and long term um, uh, focus uh, of this work. So, yeah, welcome to the next meeting. Thank you. OK, well, this is for noting, so we don't need to take a vote on it. However, if you... OK, Mark? Uh, I just wanted to uh, echo Kirsty's uh, view there, that I'm really grateful for the cross-party support on this. Um, and it would be good to um, diarise the next meeting as soon as possible. Well, not as soon as possible, but so that we'd know when the next meeting is, uh, so that we can find out where, you know, where it's going and, and continue to meet about this. I'm sure that would be entirely possible. I'm sure that's been taken on board. Ian and Kirsty, thank you for that. Okay, everybody content to note that and we'll move on? Super, thank you very much. The um, next item is item 12, the annual report of the portfolio for adult social care and public health. So I'm going to invite Councillor Cecilia Motley, who's responsible for that area as the portfolio, to present her report and move that the report and recommendations be received and agreed. Cecilia, please. Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, and uh, this uh, is a report for information for members of the work being carried out by the Adult Social Care and Public Health uh, uh, Directorates over the year 2023, um, and it provides a good overview of developments and achievements that have been delivered for both adult social care and public health. It's been a very busy year, it's been a very challenging year. We've had ongoing demand pressures, which I, I'm sure members will be aware of, right across the sector, but also we've been working very hard to bring our um, policies into line with the Shropshire uh, plan um, and uh, we've, we feel that this has been uh, working very well. Um, adult social care and public health work closely together but obviously they are both very distinct. Um, in adult social care you will be aware that we've had increasing very high demand, increasing complexity uh, over over issues such as dementia and more nursing provision required. And together with the rising costs associated with delivering services, uh, that has put more budget uh, pressures on us, despite the fact that we were on target for our savings programme. And actually, I think the, uh, the adult social care budget uh, made a magnificent effort in contributing to the savings, uh, which amounts to 42 million uh, throughout the council last year. And as far as public health is concerned, there's some fantastic work being going on in public health. Uh, we've got an overview of the context and delivery of improving outcomes in Shropshire. There are various issues which are, are um, uh, uh, mentioned in the report about uh, where we've been concentrating, particularly things like the obesity issue and uh, um, uh, cutting down on smoking and protecting our young people from vaping, etc., etc., etc. We've been working closely with our health partners throughout. Um, and the other thing that we've been particularly concentrating on in this area and in at our social care is the prevention work, so that we try and keep our population as well as we can, um, uh, both in adult social care and in public health. Uh, this is a report for information, as I said, and um, therefore I don't think we vote on it. However, I would just like to recommend to members uh, the recommendation three, which is that members receive the report and raise any issues as appropriate on the performance and activities of the functions of the Council in respect of adult social care, public health and communities. Thank you. 
Happy Thanks to very take much. Any, any questions. That's all right. I forgive you. Okay. Kevin. Kevin, Kevin Pardy. Um, it's, it's not really to do with the report. I know you're going to tell me off for that, but I'm going well, to. Well, I'll, I'll be the judge of that. Ask um, the question. Councillor Mott, you listen to what Councillor Motley does and you read what she, what she does, and etc. And it's obviously a very good portfolio holder and a, and a very hard worker. But I'm wondering whether um, merging the children's services with the adult, adult services is actually sort of um, a disadvantage for both parts because. In the old days, you'd have five, say, meetings a year, four meetings a year, and concentrating on one subject, and then four for, say, the child's. And it seems to have diluted, by, by putting them together, it diluted the whole thing, and, and they're only getting 50% of our attention. And it worries me that they're not getting the full attention that they should be, both children's services and adult services. Uh, and I, I think that's an, a disadvantage of merging the two departments. Yeah, I don't think that was completely out of the ballpark. Julia, you told me it was. I told you it wasn't. Julia. Yes, thank you. This is a really detailed report, which is welcome. Uh, I'm a little bit frustrated that this report appears on the same council agenda as an annual report for the place portfolio holder. You know, this is 80% of our budget right here in this report, and then the place portfolio is pretty much everything else. We were assured that these reports and the scrutiny annual reports are about to hear that they will be spread throughout the year so that there will be one per meeting so that we could really have the time to ask questions and get down to the detail. So, you know, it means that we're having to rush through quite a lot of detail. And it's really that financial um, topic that I want to talk about. The, the cost of adult social care is 80% of this council's budget. We've been told it's the reason, um, sorry, social care in total is 80% of this council's budget. And we've been told that that's the reason that we now have to make £62 million of cuts this year and 300 redundancies in this council. So really, we need to have, in this report, and when we look at children's, we need to have more information about the budget, the costs of delivering the care and the model that is currently being used. We should be focusing all of our attention on why it is so expensive and what we could do differently to try and best help the people vulnerable people who need support and to make sure that we're not having to make these cuts across the rest of the council. So if it's not here today and I'm afraid that the level of detail that I would have wanted isn't, I do hope that it will be uh, discussed further at scrutiny or brought back to this council. We, we can't just keep accepting that we're told it's too expensive and there's nothing we can do about it. There are lots of different models. You've heard our alternative budget about bringing some of these services in-house or halfway in-house. There are different ways to deliver services which doesn't have to put money in the private sector and we need to consider them if this is going to continue to put such a burden on our council. Thank you. Claire Wall. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I was going to um, correct Councillor Buckley but she corrected herself because actually 80% of our budget is spent on social care which actually includes children's <coughs> Uh, and I think there have been papers recently where our per person cost for adult social care is comparable with um, all other authorities. So I think this is probably best dealt with in, uh, in scrutiny. Thank you. Councillor Lizzie Picton. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. I was just going to uh, comment on a, a, the point made by, um, well, two points, really. One made by Councillor Buckley about having uh, one report on a, one council agenda. Um, now, without being rude, Councillor Buckley, we have four scrutiny committees, we have 10 or at least nine portfolios, we only have X number of council meetings a year, so we have to double them up. We have no choice in that. Um, so just that was why we can't do one at one particular meeting. And the other thing was, what I would say, Councillor Pardee, from my perspective, is that we have separate portfolio holders for adult social care and children's social care. We have separate um, senior managers over that. The only person that you're actually referring to is actually the director of people. And knowing how, um, how hard that particular director works, I would have said that that was a bit of a slur, frankly, but um, that doesn't really surprise me. Thank you. Okay, um, I've got 
Roger Evans next, but I will bring you in very briefly, Councillor Pardee, to it, because I can see you're dying to get another question out on the thing that you didn't think was anything to do with the report. So please, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'll bring Sorry, you in but next, Roger. Uh, Councillor Pickney, you got me all wrong. I wasn't looking for anything. All I'm saying is, asking the portfolio holder, does, does, does she think that the, the amount of time we spend on the two departments has been diluted because we have to split 50-50 rather than concentrate on one. I wasn't, I wasn't right. criticising uh, anybody. I think, I think, you know, at scrutiny that, that, meetings, at scrutiny that's, meetings. That's, that's fine. I think you've clarified. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, apology. No, no, that's, Any that's, chance that's, of that's an apology? Fine. And Not I'm sure the portfolio yeah. holder will, will comment on that in a minute. Roger, thank you. Kevin. Thank you, thank you Chairman. I noted, and there's others who are far more expert than I am on, in this area, but I do notice an admission, and I may have missed it, of course, but PwC have been employed for all 23 and 24, covering this, but I don't think I've picked that up at all in the report of any contribution that they've made. Have they made any contributions in, the, in this area? And if so, what are they to assist the council in delivering the services that many residents want? Okay, Cecilia. Thank you for interesting set of questions. Thank you very much, um, members. Um, Kevin, <laughs> I think probably uh, the leader has actually dealt with uh, your issue about merging children's and adults and what a bad, bad idea it is. Actually, I think that what we have to remember is, first of all, as she said, there are two separate directorates. There are the children's directorate is separate to the adults directorate, but there is a crossover point, which is when, for example, our children uh, in need and ch the children with uh, special educational needs uh, get beyond the age of 18, then they transition over to the adults uh, side of social care. And at that point, um, the, the, there is a lot of close working between the two sides. So whilst I accept the fact that uh, it, it could be viewed as a, a bad thing to have one uh, large directorate. And in fact, when you get below the surface, it is not one large directorate at all. It is two distinct uh, directorates. Um, Julia, um, I really, uh, I'm terribly sorry, I can't do anything about how the meetings are, uh, are agendered, so I can't help you on, on that side of life. The only thing that I would say, though, is that social care is expensive. We are not alone in this. We have been arguing with government for years and years and years, and I personally have been arguing with government for years and years and years about the need for parity of payment with regard to social care, particularly in rural authorities where, as we know, um, the cost of delivery of social care out in rural areas is a good deal higher than it is in urban areas. Government has steadfastly said that they were going to do something about it. And I do remember that there was one prime minister who came in uh, not very long ago and stood in front of his podium. And the first thing he said was, our first action is to deal with social care. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened. It doesn't appear, with all due respect, to all due respect to your side of the chamber, it doesn't appear as though the current leader of the opposition uh, uh, of the Labour Party uh, actually has got many ideas in this direction either, but it is absolutely desperate that social care has to be borne almost solely with, with, um, uh, with the exception of, of grant aid from government, which, we, which is never enough and we never quite know when it's coming, but um, it is parlous that we are put in a position where we really struggle to care for our elderly and care for our children. So I just want to make that point. This is nothing to do with us, but it's not for want of trying to convince government that actually it's essential that they support adult social care because everybody is ageing, unfortunately. Roger, you want to know how uh, PwC has helped us uh, to save... May I just say that the, what, the principal way they've, that they've helped us is... Um, to enable adult social care to save £16 million without having to make any redundancies, and we couldn't have done it without them. So I think that's uh, quite a point. And I think the other thing is that there's a huge amount of transformation that's gone on in uh, adult social care and in public health both. 
and PwC have been invaluable in, in stress testing what we want to do and helping us through it. So they have been extremely useful, but they have been sensible enough to just keep themselves behind the arras, as it were, uh, and not publicise themselves because they're here to help us, they're here to serve us, they're here to do what we want them to do and not the other way about. Um, so I think that answers it, Chairman. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Well, it's only for noting, so uh, we will move on to item 13, which is the annual report, Health uh, and Adult Social Care Overview and Security Committee, including joint HOSC, I believe. I'm going to invite Councillor Jeff Elner um, to present the report. Um, well, can I say, Mr Chairman, that, that a lot of the period of time that this report is written on was under the chairmanship of, of Councillor Steve Charmley, who's here, and he would like to, can we do something together? He would very much like to cover the areas that he was responsible for. Okay, Steve Charmley, I'll let you come okay, in, because I'm to see you were there. Thank you, Chair. Um, as Councillor Ellen has said, this report is historical and looks back at the work that HASC undertook uh, during the year 2022-23. Uh, the committee considered a, a range of topics during the year, and these included, but not exclusively, two. Uh, Shrewsbury Health and Wellbeing Hub, Bishop's Castle Community Hospital Closure, the Fuller Report on Primary Care, and a Task and Finish Report on the Prevention, Primary Care, Urgent and Emergency Care, and its impact on a rural and sparse county. Um, there was a lot more in the background which is in the report so I won't need to uh, bore you with that because I'm sure you've already read it. Can I take this opportunity to <coughs> thank both officers and members uh, who supported and served on the committee during uh, the time which I was chairman. Um, there was a lot of work went in and it is much appreciated and I look forward to hearing about the progress um, that since Councillor Ellen has taken, taken over the chairmanship. Uh, questions are welcome, but obviously uh, answers may not be possible from me uh, since the health landscape has probably moved on since I stepped aside. But uh, I will do my best. Thank you. Councillor Heather Kidd. That was quick. I thought you would well, wait. I wasn't. He was. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, two points I'd like to raise on this, and I have been very involved in um, joint HOSC and HOSC and HASC for a very long time. The Bishop's Castle Community Hospital, I must say, um, is, has gone on from strength to strength, but I was very disappointed at that particular meeting that the whole presentation from Shropcom was uh, shut down before we could even see it. Um, despite that, we look as if we may well uh, be on the road to the board meeting on the 4th of April, reopening the hospital because recruitment has worked very well, and I think alongside that, probably... My colleague here will raise some of those things that have happened that possibly people, other people in the chamber may need to know. The other issue that's uh, been very, very live and is still live today, and I think scrutiny will need to come back to and look at again, is the <coughs> possible demise of the Welsh Air Ambulance, which covers huge areas along the border, which looked as if it was going to be saved, but... The latest report says it's going to go to North Wales, which means that its flight time to us along the border is very high. Uh, there's a lot of disquiet, and many, many people in Mid Wales and across Shropshire along the border there are now looking not to donate money, or even, and they're cancelling standing orders to the Welsh Air Ambulance. So it's a significant issue. That decision has now been put on hold, so I think there is a, a place now for Jeff and and I to pick that up again for the future. So it's just a flagging of what we're doing. I must say <coughs> that <coughs> the whole of this scrutiny committee is now working far better than it has done. And the advent of uh, a dedicated officer to it has made a fundamental difference. Um, I just hope that during the cuts we're not going to lose them. Thank you. I've got... Kate Halliday and then Ruth Talton. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and just to echo that sentiment, um, the, the scrutiny officers for health are, are really excellent and have done a, a great job. And 
uh, just also, we have some great um, co-op team members as well as councillors who have worked in the task and finish groups. Um, it can be really frustrating sitting on the HOSC and the joint HOSC, which I also sit on. Um, the, our local hospital has been in special measures now um, and rated inadequate since um, 2018. Um, they were called to a meeting in December as one of five of the worst performing trusts <clears throat> regarding their A&E provision in, in December. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the, with the task and finish groups, which ran in particular the one um, for the A&E and uh, highlighted again and again the problem with the long uh, waiting times, uh, which didn't really exist in this county and uh, in quite the same way. I'm not saying they were good, but, you know, back in 2018, one patient was recorded as uh, waiting more than 12 hours um, in A&E. And obviously that's changed pretty dramatically um, to, I think, in December 23, 1,068 people waiting that long. So it, we, we, we're, the situation's not great for health. Um, we now have a recruitment free, um, freeze because there's, a, there's lots of problems with in terms of their, their, their deficit, 91 million um, instead of 45 million. And, also, we've had some very disappointing staff surveys. And uh, the reason I'm, I'm pointing this out, I don't want to depress everybody uh, um, uh, or to, to bash our health colleagues, but there's a, there's a lot of work this committee um, has been doing, I think, really effectively, and we, we need to continue to do. Um, and certainly, the residents of Shropshire deserve better. And, uh, and while in these figures, it's reflected the problems with rural funding um, and um, the kind of cinder Cinderella amounts of money that the rural areas get both in health and uh, social care. There are bigger issues here. There are other rural areas who are doing much better than this. So this is a really important committee that I'm very, um, very pleased to be vice chair of currently. Um, uh, so we need to carry on holding scrutiny um, and, and health to account. We do have problems. We have some really good engagement, but also a lot of disappointing engagement with me, people not turning up or providing the information we need. Um, but there's a really strong team working hard to try and get the, the answers that residents uh, deserve. Um, and I just wanted to mention one thing, that there has been a change to the scrutiny um, uh, the legislation basically changed to scrutiny in which the, the scrutiny committee can no longer refer direct to the uh, Secretary of State in the same way that we did. So I think I'll, I'll look forward to us working in scrutiny to make sure we carry on being a really strong and uh, robust committee able to, to, to pull health in and try and work out what's happening and also to try and help them where, you know, because we're in a great position to do that as well. Thank you. It sounded like a ringing endorsement, I think. Uh, Councillor Ruth Houghton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I note in the report the few bullet points between 7.8 and 7.11 on Bishop's Castle Community Hospital. Um, which really don't uh, demonstrate the progress and the work that's been undertaken to, um, towards reopening that hospital. Um, and that's down to the community who, led by the Mayor of Bishop's Council and along with Councillor Kidd and Harton and myself, in that we tried to understand the needs of the community and focused on that and then focused on the recruitment campaign, which has been successful, um, having spent a few Saturday mornings interviewing nurses with colleagues from the uh, our health colleagues. You know, we have had nurses coming forward. The last recruitment day was um, this Saturday just gone. It's looking extremely positive that enough staff have come forward. But it is down to the Save the Beds group in Bishop's Castle who have been incredibly active, been a bit of a thorn in the side, I suspect, for health with their publicity on television, radio and everything else. But the fact remains that the hospital is needed in that very rural area. And hopefully on April the 4th, when Shropshire Community NHS Trust meet at their board meeting, we will have the positive outcome that we all anticipate. Um, otherwise, I suspect the publicity round will start again. Thank you. 
Thank you. Councillor Bernie Bentick. Can we... Um... Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I would like to endorse the uh, previous speakers in, in uh, lauding the um, work and the dedication <coughs> of the council officers on the Health and View Scrutiny Committee and the importance of the community hospitals and other community facilities in supporting the whole health economy of Shropshire. Um, this report is for 2022-23, and I would like to ask, why is this report being presented today almost a year out of date? And will the host report for 2023-24 be presented as soon as possible, preferably by June 2024, so that any learning can be implemented in good time? The second thing I'd like to ask is, why the report has ignored a vital publication by the British Medical Journal in 2022 of the outcomes of over 5 million patient attendances to England's emergency departments between 2016 and 2018, which gave a clear roadmap to improve our emergency health services and has not been looked at, let alone implemented. There are still large numbers of patients languishing in Shropshire's overcrowded emergency departments, some for up to 60 hours waiting for a bed for admission. And that is an absolute scandal that should never happen. It certainly didn't happen in the 20th century, so why is it happening in the 21st century? And in relation to these dreadful statistics, I'd like to ask whether HOSC will require the Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital NHS Trust to provide a regular update of important key performance indices, including weights for admission, including deaths in the A&E department and other uh, important statistics that it does not provide at the present time. Finally, why is the Shropshire, Telford and Rekin integrated <coughs> integrated care system and its predecessor Shropshire uh, Clinical Commissioning Group still amongst the worst performing healthcare systems for the last five years despite the Shrewsbury and Telford Trust Board being largely replaced in 2019 with a remit to improve its services. Thank you. Thank you for that. For those of you who heard that me ring, I do apologise. I'm not following my own advice. Um, but I did grab it in my car keys on the way out when the fire alarm went and forgot that I put it in my pocket. But that was just in case we were stuck out there for three or four hours. So, so um, yeah. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Tracy Huffer. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say that I, I'm a member on this committee and it's actually a really good committee and, and like Heather, we're doing a lot of good work and um, it's actually a pleasure to sit on this committee now. I think we're working very well together. But what I want to note is I applaud Bishop's Castle and um, the fact that they've now fully recruited and they're moving forward. But we, by concentrating on Bishop's Castle, we've actually slightly forgotten about Ludlow Community Hospital and I think they've been left on the back burner a little bit and what I would like to see is Shropcom actually do a recruitment drive for Ludlow Community Hospital and at least update us on the situation there because currently Shrop, Shropcom um, seem to think it's fair to take staff from Ludlow Community Hospital, not to Bishop's Castle I have to say, but to Telford and other areas so depleting our staff there. I understand this there's, there's a freeze on the recruitment drive in Shrewsbury and Telford, but we should not be taking staff from Ludlow Community Hospital, um, depleting um, the numbers we have there, which only makes me call me a cynic, but it sort of makes me um, think that actually there is some underlying reason why we've got depletion of staff. We've got a, an ultrasound scanner that we, fu we funded through and um, the League of Friends bought ourselves and that has been taken away as well. So um, what I would like to see, and I know Jeff will take this on when we talk about community hospitals, 
um, that actually there is um, an appraisal of what's actually going on at Ludlow Community Hospital um, um, because, you know, I see that it's, it's actually quite vulnerable or very vulnerable. Thank you. Okay. Jeff. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, since I've taken chairmanship of this, um, I'd like to update you on that. There are questions that, that people just raised, the Bernie's just raised questions about death rates and people and so on and so on. We are already formulating questions to try and get those answered. Um, so things are, are, things are ongoing. Um, the first half of the discussion I took very well because I think everybody here seemed very enthusiastic about how well the committee has done and the work they've done in Shropshire. Um, the report, there's still areas that do need revisiting, such as the Shrewsbury Health Hub. Um, this was stalled because of lack of finance, but the problem has not gone away. We still have surgeries that need modernising, um, and the problem is going to come back again at some stage. Bishop's Castle, correct, uh, there's been a lot of good work done there. The situation is getting better, um, and I can assure you that Heather Kidd and Ruth Houghton, together with the committee, will be monitoring events, and I promise you that that will happen. Um, what hasn't been mentioned, which I'm really proud of, is last year the committee produced an excellent report entitled Rural Proofing in Health and Care which investigated the difficulties encountered in delivering services within rural areas. The recommendations of this report have been shared with all members and neighbouring authorities and partners, and already recommendations have started to be adopted together with the use of a rural toolkit. And this committee uh, is adamant that we will be continuing to monitor the adoption um, of all these policies. We're not just going to publish a report and say we've done our bit and walk away. We are going to ensure that our recommendations are followed and if they're not working, then we will revisit the project. Um, the HOSC committee, together with the joint HOSC, do share, as been pointed out, ongoing concerns about the amount of time that the Shrewsbury and Telford Hospital Trust have been placed and rated as inadequate. Um, and we will try and we are trying to decide or trying to discover exactly what will happen when the report that's due any any week now um, still rates the trust as inadequate. What can we do? So rest assured, we've got our eyes on that. We are not letting it go. Um, it's not right that a hospital keeps failing and failing and failing year on year, and somebody needs to do something about it. And our committee is um, trying to ask questions and get answers as to what can be done. I would say the committee do work well on an apolitical basis. We work very well. All our decisions are based on common sense, not on political point scoring. We effectively engage with cabinet, all members, officers and health providers, and we will continue to do so and continue to challenge health providers, ambulance services, etc., to ensure that all those in need are enjoying the best standard of service that they can get and they're entitled to. We do work well together with social care and public health to scrutinise the needs and delivery of health and wellbeing and to support initiatives to improve the health of our residents and to reduce the need to access medical services. So I do think we're a very good cross-functional team. We, we, we work together very well. None of this work would be possible if it was not for the hard work and forward-looking team that we have. And I'm most grateful to, to, to Councillor Kate Halliday, who, as we've said, is the, is the committee chair, for all her advice and hard work. And we must, we certainly must, mention officers Sophie Foster and Tom Dodds for everything they do for us, because without them, we would not achieve what we've achieved. Shropshire has an ageing population faced with the challenge of Rurality and sparsity has been said and needs a joined up coordinated health and care system. And despite the fact that currently the council have an unhealthy finance, it is very good to know that Shropshire currently have 
healthy residents who have life expectancy greater than the national average. So on that basis, I truly believe that we are doing something right. I'd, I'd ask you... Down to the last this, 10 seconds, Jeff. Yeah, OK. I'd ask you, you haven't read this report. Please read it, and I hope you consider that the report is a true reflection of what's happened in the last year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, we don't need to take a vote on this because it is just for noting. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Steve, there wasn't anything you wanted to add. I don't think you... No, good. Okay, so we will move on to uh, item 14, which is the annual report, the portfolio holder for climate change, environment and transport. So we invite Councillor Ian Nellins, and I won't read out his portfolio, because I've just said it to present... Um, it says present her report in here, but I'm sure that's not right. Uh, present his report and move the report and recommendations be received and agreed. Ian. I'll say it in a higher voice. Um, the climate crisis is already recognised as a significant strategic risk to Shropshire and the delivery of council and public services. The climate action and carbon reduction are integral to all aspects of the Shropshire plan, that being healthy people, healthy economy, healthy environment and a healthy organisation. Um, the report details how the council is taking active uh, steps through the implementation of adopted corporate climate strategy and action plan and supporting wider community efforts allows the Council to make a demonstrable contribution to reducing the carbon footprint of the wider county, as well as leading by example by reducing its own carbon footprint. It is also important to recognise that the path to our corporate net zero goal will take time and improvements will not be linear. Commissioned and outsourced services represent 93% of our footprint, and this will be an increasing focus over the coming year in order to drive down emissions. The Climate Change Agenda was considered by the Environment and, and Economy Scrutiny Committee in January 24 and generated wide-ranging discussion. The Scrutiny Committee, Scrutiny Committee are proposing to establish a standing task and finish group to consider climate change and carbon reduction in more detail. A range of pro projects and initiatives continue to be developed and implement, implemented to help the Council improve its own performance. A wide range of Council staff outside the Climate Task Force also contribute actively to carbon reduction and climate action projects. Examples are the Affordable Warmth Team, who have been extremely successful in attracting substantial amounts of government grants to retrofit homes. Um, facilities Management Service, who are working out how we can best improve the energy and carbon performance of both our existing buildings and new construction projects. Highways and Transport, by insulating grant-funded EV charging infrastructure across the county, improving carbon performance of the Council's vacant fleets and highway services. Um, grant funding the climate team has attracted government capital and revenue grant funds totaling £4.3 million to date. This is an example of some of the projects. Uh, the pyrolysis or biochar Shropshire Council is currently procuring a demonstrator plant to test the use of pyrolysis, um, which will in, uh, uh, create biochar which can be used to store carbon. It's a technology that can be widely deployed commercially in Shropshire and generate green growth. Um, green hydrogen, we're also looking at the feasibility. The Council is therefore look, working with a range of commercial and academic stakeholders on a project to test hydrogen refuelling with a view of having our own small-scale demonstrator facility in, in the future. On the waste side, the waste is a contract, it's one of the biggest contracts in the Council. It provides residents with a very good service which has recorded the fewest complaints in any local authority in the country. The report outlines the challenges, the statutory requirements for waste and the opportunities through recycling energy from waste and waste minimisation. Reducing the amount of waste that residents produce in Shropshire can have several benefits ranging from protection of natural resources, conserving energy, reducing carbon emissions and the financial benefits to the Council of reducing our collection costs. Current waste minimisation, minimisation initiatives include Master Composter Programme, Shropshire Good Food Partnership, social media, piggybacking on national and local campaigns, outreach and public engagement, and there's also moves to prevent waste to HCRs, household uh, recy recycling centres, uh, from outside of the Shropshire Council area. Further to a recent motion at Council, a revised waste minimisation plan is now being developed. This will include relevant con uh, consultation and is due to be discussed and agreed at full Council in September 24. Uh, public transport, first of all, sorry, that was late uh, coming in and was de uh, disseminated to all members this morning. Uh, you'll be aware that the majority of our bus operators are reporting that many bus services have been underused 
a, a drop of 70% since the pandemic. The vast majority of our services are subsequently either supported directly by the Council or indirectly through government revenue support. The report for, for transport includes funding support, bus service improvement plan, the BSIP plus funding. Um, at the end of last year, the, uh, we, we received £1.8 million because we had a plan that will be funding will be delivered from April 24. It also includes a Shropshire Enhanced Partnership, Bus Partnership, new service developments and on demand. Members will be aware that our first electric bus has been deployed since December and supplemented by other new low emission vehicles and a further smaller electric, electric bus. There is a plan to extend this out the on demand service in the 24-25 uh, year. Active travel, the report also uh, Report uh, contains a report on the LC local cycling road infrastructure plan, and its introduction will help our ratings and improve future funding opportunities. I'd like to thank the Climate Change and the wider, wider council, council services for their support in this report. And thank you. Here. Thank you. Pretty well, much exactly, Tom. But there you go. Good. Okay. Again, it's one for noting. Um, I have had some indications for a number of people. Um, let's, let's try and um, concentrate on questions for the subject area as opposed to a wider political debate. Julia Evans. Thank you, Chair. Um, reading this report, I'd like to congratulate the Affordable Warmth Team. Uh, this is one of the better performing services when it comes to supporting our community, despite the short-termist nature of the grant funding available and they do well getting money out of the door alongside the partners at the Marches Energy Agency, who should also be congratulated. Given that the Climate Task Force has attracted £4.3 million in grant funding to date, why decimate it with £220,000 cuts? This is very short-sighted because we haven't got an adaption strategy yet. With the wettest winter on record, we know increasingly that we have to adapt both the council and the county because the team are key to generating the income and help to build a climate resilient local economy. We need to invest more in public transport and active travel. The only way that the council has proper control of schemes and can actually get them done instead of temporary measures being rolled out time and time again like the Shrewsbury Centre scheme uh, in my area, the Cromiel Lane. So far, there's been a refusal to commit any percentage towards active travel measures, so we are completely reliant on the vagaries of the De Department for Transport Funding. Yet we commit 17 million to a road without a full business case. Carbon literacy training is still ongoing. Um, this is out prioritised by other urgencies like cost-cutting measures. When will the staff be fully trained? We need data. Without data, we cannot measure outcomes. What is our carbon footprint? How much can we save or have saved? There are many things we need to take into account. How many staff work from home? What usage in increase on energy and overall reduction do they contribute to the whole council system? Our fleet usage, our energy usage, what mitigating things are we doing as a council? We're leading by example. Are there changes in procurement? How have we reduced our footprint by 1%? This report feels that there's no substance to it. As an afterthought, now that central government has been downgraded, any net zero visions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Heather Kidd, then Councillor Bernie Bentick, then Councillor Alex Wagner, then Councillor Rob Wilson, then Councillor Viv Parry. Um, if we could stick to... Oh, crikey, we might be here till five o'clock. <laughs> Okay. Um, thank, thank you, you. Thank you uh, Chairman. I have two questions for the portfolio holder. Um, one is around the affordable warmth, war um, and I didn't know whether Ian was aware, but um, the affordable warmth grant for park homes is insu insufficient. It's capped at 15,000, and I have park homes in my division where you have people who really can't afford to heat their homes, um, needing up to 23,000 which means that all of those schemes have been discontinued. It's a significant problem for people who are stuck in housing that is like that. Otherwise, in 
good social, uh, have a good social basis for living there. So I'm asking the portfolio holder to lobby government to actually look at that cap because it is, is seriously insignificant and they can't fall, afford to top up by eight or ten thousand um, pounds. So that's my first uh, point and I really would like you to, to do something about that. There was also meant to be some guidance coming out um, which was due to be released at last autumn around park homes and park home insulation for councils. Mm -hmm. and that hasn't mm -hmm. appeared either and we're now on the 20th of March. So if you could encourage people to do that, I'd be grateful because uh, although we've had quite a mild winter, those, those people in park homes uh, live in fear of the cold all the winter. And one particular lady is quite distressed by it because she's now had three winters of, of hoping that we're going to be in warmer weather. So... That's my first question. My second question is around 4.15 on your uh, report, which <coughs> is about um, a weekly food waste collection, which is really important in many, many ways, um, but actually will be terribly expensive across the whole of Shropshire. And as you will know, I have um, raised my fears around the food waste collection disappearing if we start... Um, paying for green bins because at present certainly in the south and I know in other areas of the county uh, food is collected in with the green waste so my questions around that are what is the gap because you tell us it's not a, not <coughs> significant here even when you take into consideration charging for the green bin collection what is the gap that you need to fill so that you can actually comply with the 26 27 equality of collections um, act that the government has brought in how will we fill that gap and what is likely to happen between the two things coming in because our <coughs> recycling rates will drop significantly when we stop collecting wa uh, food waste co at all so there are a number of things there that I'm concerned about charging for green bins per se I'm not that worried about but I am very worried about doing that and having no way of collecting the food waste. Thank you. Councillor Bernie Bentick. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I, I'd like to um, acknowledge the cross-party collaboration of the Active Travel Working Group, uh, which I think was very effective in bringing forward a comprehensive plan However, since the announcement of funding in May uh, 2023, uh, the Active Travel Working Group has not met. And this is despite my and others' request to do so. And also for an update on the implementation of the Active Travel uh, Working Plan. And then all of a sudden... Um, at the end of February 2024, a document was produced by Shropshire Council and WSP with regard to the meal active travel quarter, which I and many others contributed to, to including um, several members and including um, local residents. However, um, we were not consulted in any detail about the specific plans and a central section that binds the whole thing together which is the Longdon Road um, section between the roundabout at Roman Road and Mousecroft Lane has been completely amputated from the current plan that's looking for development. Additionally the junction of Bank Farm Road and um, Longdon Road, which is the section of most collisions and most congestion and most risk of injury, has been completely um, omitted. There are a number of uh, improvements to the Mousecroft Lane, Stanley Lane, Longdon Road junction, which have been completely ignored despite a petition of over half the residents on the Sweet Lake Meadow uh, development, um, very strongly asking for some improvements to improve both 
cycling and walking, and these have been completely ignored. Um, I've not even had an acknowledgement from the officer that I sent the petition to. Finally, um, the section of the uh, new plan, that which is the roundabout at London Road and Roman Road, um, looks as though it's been designed around motorists because the principal supposed improvement is two lanes at the approach to the roundabout rather than concentrating on active travel improvements. And I'm afraid that it, it to my eye, in no way uh, corresponds with the local traffic note uh, one stroke 20, which is supposed to be the guideline for cycling infrastructure within England. So I'd like to ask the portfolio holder the reasons for these um, omissions and what we can do about it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not sure how much of that actually Ian can answer, and maybe not the member for um, Morris the Highways, but um, anyway. Um, I think we could all probably, and this is just, a, I, I guess, a, a request from me, um, find little bits of highways in our patch that aren't particularly good for active travel. Um, we are on the report. Um, if we could stick to the report, um, that would be jolly useful. A lot of the questions that I'm hearing could actually be asked outside of this chamber. Um, but there we go. That's, that's just a request from me. Mr Chairman, they have. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Bentick. Councillor Wagner. Thanks. Um, just uh, before I start, um, I, I looked through the agenda when it came out. I looked through it at our group meeting on Tuesday and even at 9.40 this morning, and obviously the transport supplement came basically as prayers were starting, um, which I realise there's probably reasons for, but it does make it quite hard to scrutinise it when you know it comes to us a minute before the meeting begins. Um, However, in the transport supplement um, are um, a number of the things I wanted to mention. Uh, first of all, on demand, I'll, I'll admit I was slightly sceptical about whether it would work. Um, I think it's been a real success story. Um, I think it's clearly the direction of travel, no pun intended, for quite a lot of these services. And um, all I wanted to ask is obviously 24-5, assuming we're talking like financial years, that, that's starting pretty sharpish. And I was wondering if there had been any conversation about which routes might be heading in that direction. I really need to stop making these puns. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention was the park and ride. Um, I know it's not specifically mentioned in the report, and I suppose this is a year hence, but um, cutting the fees is a really good thing. Um, I was wondering if the portfolio holder had put any thought into whether or not there would be any scope to even look at making it free in conjunction with the movement strategy. I mean, I can't imagine it's raising much revenue, and actually the added benefit to the town centre of getting cars out of the town is pretty enormous. It might also, for residents in places like mine, Bicton Heath, um, kind of encourage people to, to do that modal shift that the movement strategy is looking at. A final quick point I wanted to raise, which I've, uh, I have emailed separately, but I thought would be worth mentioning, is um, we brought in these um, VMSs, these, uh, I can't remember what the term is, for the, basically the 12 boards on the outskirts of Shrewsbury that tell you when the car parks are full. Um, when they were brought in a couple of years ago, uh, the ambition was for them to also have sort of messages about roads and messages about traffic. And to be honest with you, all is on them almost all of the time is the fact that there are X number of car parking spaces. And I'm not actually convinced that they're very accurate all the time. So I was wondering if those could be looked at and whether the scope of what they tell residents about could be expanded beyond just the old road closure and how many spaces there are at the key town centre car parks. Uh, an idea that a resident of mine brought up was having them say there's a 20 minute delay on Smithfield Road or there's a 15 minute delay in the town centre, use the inner bypass, use the outer bypass and these are things which could actually impact traffic in the town centre and wouldn't really cost very much. Um, so I realise that's four things in quick succession but I won't take any more time. Thank you. Councillor Rob Wilson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I note that the report mentions in three points the production of the LC WHIP and the potential future adoption by Council of the LC WHIP. It, it is worth noting that LC WHIPs were first created by the government in 2017. And it has taken this Council seven years to get to that point, but I'm pleased that we are there now. Um, my, my point really, my question to the portfolio holder, is the things that are missing 
from this active travel service in the report, and, and, and I'll do this very quickly. New Street in Shrewsbury is still a temporary scheme. Chromio Lane in Shrewsbury is still a temporary scheme. The Town Heads Internationalisation Trial is still a temporary scheme. School streets, we have one at Colon. There are six on the way that were meant to come in earlier this year. They still haven't. Um, LT120 has been adopted by this council in September 2020, but there's, there's no real, um, it's not very clear that that's actually being adopted in designs that are coming out, and I'll get onto that later. Um, there's the new bridge in Oswald Street that goes to the business park that doesn't exist, from a cycle park that doesn't exist, um, and doesn't conform to regulations. There's a Port Hill Copthorne 20 mile an hour zone that was agreed by Cabinet, and I asked, we had an update from the head of strategic projects six months ago, and I've been asking for an update regularly, and so has Councillor Dean since then, and there has been no update on that. That was first proposed in 2021. Councillor Wagner was waiting for petition crosses in Gaines Park. Um, we still lack. Um, LTP4. I, I think the point I'm getting to is we can make noises about this stuff, but delivery is very, very poor. And active travelling have said that. Our capability score from them is one out of four. I, I really do not see that changing. Um, Councillor Bentick has pointed out the meal active travel quarter that, that is lacking in areas. Um, there was a mini Holland development programme um, where we were given money by the government and a report was produced that still hasn't come out in the public domain or to councillors. Um, the Shrewsbury Movement and Public Space Strategy is a very good document, um, but given the track record, I'm not sure whether this council is capable of delivering it. Um, finally, we, we find out recently that the A5191, for those who don't know, it's Heathgate through the town centre, out to the Welsh Bridge, and then out through Bellevue. Uh, it seems like it's been designed with no reference to the Shrewsbury Public space and movement strategy. It's just a, another kind of inner silo hodgepodge of bits and pieces. Um, it's not part of this holistic view that's being created. Um, and, and finally, I'll say that for a fiscally responsible council, what we're doing is relying on the begging bowl culture of Westminster. They give us a little bit of porridge. We have to put a little bit of ours in as well, but then we have to eat it by lunchtime. Um, if this council were to put its own funding into these schemes, it would have control over how they were delivered. Whereas every time we're told well, there's not enough for the Roman Road roundabout, and, we, and it's at traveling, so we have to kind of spend it by this time, we've got to rush the consultation because we've got to get to this point. It's, it, it's not working. Um, and the last point I'd make is that the return on investment for road schemes, and this is very important for being fiscally responsible and cutting our cloth accordingly, Return investment for a road scheme is between one to one and one to five. For an active travel scheme, it's between one to five pound fifty and one to thirty-two pounds. So we put one pound in, we can get up to thirty-two pounds back. And there was a recent report that even said for low traffic neighbourhoods, it's between one to ten and up to one to two hundred pound return on investment. Thank you. Thank you. I've got councillors Viv Parry, Julia Buckley, Kevin Pardy, and Dean Carroll. And then I think I'm going to close this one down because I think we'll have given it a good kicking around. Viv. Um, I remember years and years ago, yourself, uh, you weren't chairman then, we went to Baston Hill and we looked at the waste, uh, food service, and the waste. And we walked around and said, how wonderful it was. Isn't this a wonderful thing? What we're doing now, we're keeping it all separate. It's so clean. And all the people who lived in Basin Hill took it in their stride. They thought it was wonderful. If we're going to have separate, are we going to be dumping the food in the ordinary dust, dustbin? Is that what you're going to bring it to? Is there going to be any money at all for us to do anything with it? If it's food waste, is it going to be dumped like it was before in the ordinary dustbin? I don't call that... I, call that going backwards rather than forwards. Um, if you go into Ludlow, we have a situation, and I'm sorry to bring this back to you, where we are getting food and all household things dumped on the car parks and in the parks. We have got people from Airbnbs dumping it. I've brought this up before, but not just that now. We have got new restaurants that are not paying what they should be paying 
to have it removed. I've had the officer from here come and I've complained about Castle Street Car Park. If you go down there, the smell is atrocious. We have a brand new restaurant there who has, must have 15 bins all along the back wall. Half of them have no tops on them and there's food waste all hanging out all over the floor. Nothing is ever swept up. We've got people dumping household waste. So if you're going to shut Craven Arms Waste Station, don't you think you're going to get, it's going to get worse rather than better? I'm sorry for you to say that you don't think it's going to affect <laughs> South Shropshire. As, as councillors in South Shropshire, that is the main question at the moment. Are, you, are they going to shut this waste station? Because it will be very, very bad for our area. We are going to get the laybys full of all sorts of things, and, and some of it not very nice. And it's going to cost this council an awful lot of money. Now, I've also got another thing to do with buses. I've been trying to get an officer to speak to me from this council about the bus service in Ludlow. The bus service in Ludlow is, needs looking at. The people who own the bus company would like to have a word with him. We want to sit down as a council, the town council, parish councils, myself, and the people who own the bus service. We would like smaller buses, I know, and he's prepared to pay for them himself. Um, and we also would like, because my road is going to be shut for two months outside my house, and so it's going to be the, the, the whole route of the town bus service is going to be altered. Whilst it's being altered, then, why can't we have somebody to look at it and make sure this, this bus service is working properly? At the moment, the two buses that we have follow one another in, and the two buses that we have follow one another out. It's wasting, it's wasting the bus route. We need our bus route to run properly, and we've not got that. Now, I've had my little shout for today, and I hope you're going to look at one. See, I cannot get hold of any officers to do anything for me. You know, it, it really is hard. Thank you. Thank you. Julia Buckley, Councillor Julia Buckley. Thank you. I agree with the principle, which is the concern over the risk of closing one or two recycling centres could lead to additional fly tipping. I suppose my concern is why it was omitted from this report. So we're being presented with a year's worth of achievements um, from the portfolio holder for climate change. And in there at section 4.2 and 3, we're told all about the recycling centres and the work that they do. We were all issued this morning at breakfast with an update about the wonderful news about additional funding for buses. Why were we not given the update that you're now planning to close one or two recycle <coughs> centres which could lead to lots of problems with fly tipping so that you can save the grand total of £14,000 out of your £62 million deficit. I would have thought that that was perhaps one of the most pressing, updated pieces of information that should have been reported on so that we can discuss how serious those proposals are. Thank you. Councillor Kevin Party. Thank you, Chair. Just a quickie. <coughs> if we, we look at 4.23 um, about uh, waste bins, um, I've been speaking to people about the wheelie bins, the green bins, and people have been telling me, well, if they go, I'm not paying for, I'm not paying for one. What I'll do is put my rubbish in a black plastic bag and put it in the general waste. Um, and the, the, the portfolio holder says there's no evidence that, that fly tipping will increase. Well, I'd like to know if you've got any hard copy evidence of that, because every, uh, every now and again, when you're watching uh, the news, there are people all over the country complaining about fly tipping. So I, I'd like that to be evidence-based and not just sort of hearsay. Um, and, f and, and as far as people not fly tipping because, uh, because it's a crime, well, if people didn't fly tip because it was a crime, you wouldn't have fly tipping. Would you? So, so that's certainly not true. And I'd like to, something that really, really worries me is the ease with which trees are just cut down for developments. Unless it's got a TPO, the trees have got no chance in, in some 
developments. But those other trees, I'm not an expert, but those other trees that are around that haven't got a TPO are just as important, surely, in the fight against climate change as those with a TPO. Uh, and I've noticed over, over the years how many trees are just dispensed with uh, without any second thought. Those trees may be replaced by new trees in other areas, but that they're efficiency won't be the same for years and years, for decades. So I, I think we need a closer look on what's going on. And I have an example in my own area last week of, of trees, healthy trees being cut down by this council, cut down because they're, they're um, adjacent to a cycle track. And the problem was moss. So what are you going to do? You're going to cut 20 healthy trees down because of moss instead of getting out there with a brush and scrubbing the moss away. So, so I'd like us to take more notes and more consideration of trees. Thank you. Councillor Dean Carroll. Thank you, Chairman. A couple of things. Firstly, on something that Councillor Wilson said um, that I take quite a bit of issue with because, frankly, it seems contradictory to statements he's made in the past in which I'm sure that I've heard him say that he wants to see um, infrastructure precede development and not follow development. Now, he's criticising us for building a bridge to a business park that hasn't been built yet, a business park that is on the way, but he's criticising us for putting the infrastructure in place first. I'm sure that he would be the first to criticise if we didn't build the bridge before building the business park and left it as an afterthought. I think that that level of hypocrisy should give, give the member something to think about. Coming on to something Councillor Pardy said, with all due respect, not all trees have an equal level of amenity value or carbon capture value. Those of the greatest importance and of the greatest value are protected with tree preservation orders. However, I am aware of studies, and I've read studies that show that, in comparison, well-maintained grassland can actually sequester as much or more carbon than low-value tree planting. So not all things are equal. Not all trees are equal in that sense. And it's a, it's a balance of what is the right solution in the right place. Okay. Now, I had said that I would end it there, but Roger has, has looked at me with puppy dog eyes and, and assured me that he will keep it short. So, Roger. Thank you, Chairman. It is a question, and when we can get an answer for it, I'm not sure, but it's in 4.3 on page 283, and it's in the Integrated Waste PFI contract. In 4.3, the sentence reads... A suit, and it's to do with the in-vessel composting facility. The sentence reads, a suitable site has now been identified and plans for the plant will be put forward once a decision on future collections of food and garden waste have been agreed. I would like to know where the suitable site is, and I'm sure many other members would like. It may depend on the food and waste gardens, but if a site has been identified, let us know about it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Nellins. Did I just get five minutes, yeah? <laughs> right, there's a lot there which is very encouraging that people are so interested in, in all the aspects, so that's, that's, a, that's a good start. Um, I'll probably miss out a lot of this because um, I've, I've made scruffy notes here, but um, I'll just pick them up as I see them, won't be in the order they came in. Um, Viv Parry, but you, you waste. I did put you in contact. I put you in contact with the, um, with the, uh, what do you call them? The, no, anyway, the, the relevant officer a couple of months ago. Um, I don't know if you if you've got any joy out of that, but I copied you into into an email. Right. Um, so we, we can continue to look at that if you take it up with that relevant officer again. On the buses, uh, Ludlow has uh, fortunate to have two bus services, not unlike a lot of other. Uh, market times, but again, I will speak to the uh, to the uh, officers in charge just to see how that right. How that's that's enough. Thank you. Right. Um, on the uh, 
uh, on the thing about the household recycling centres. Very, first of all, there's been no decision made on closing of any household uh, recycling centres. And if it is clear, and I did send the thing out to all members to say every option is being looked at. Uh, what might end up happening, well, there's a number of things that might end up happening, but the, that is the worst case <coughs> scenario that was being looked at. That is the worst case scenario in order to have a balanced budget. It may well be that all recycling centres close for one day per week. It may well be that there is another form of charging done, but it is statutory at the minute that it is a free service. We are also obviously looking at the ability to stop outside uh, group outside of shops are coming to use our household recycling centres. So there's a lot of work being done there, and we don't want to close them. We're looking at various options of how we can raise that funding. It's not £14,000, it's actually £300,000. The £14,000 will be part of it. The £300,000 comes into the contractual aspects of it. So there's £300,000 to be made up somewhere. Uh, officers are looking at that, and we're quite hopeful that we can do that from, from, uh, from other ways. But at the minute, um, we have to look up the options which are which are available. Um, on the, the trans, uh, expansion of transport on demand, yes, we are hoping to exp expand that in the in the sort of wider area of where it already is. So it won't be going to any of the market towns as yet. It's most likely to be extended to uh, the periphery of where it already already ex uh, exists, because then it won't be, require as much funding in order to put on one or two extra, extra buses. Um, park and ride, as you know, park and ride has been reduced, or will be reduced from April to one pound. It's not possible to, to do it any less than that, but that hopefully that will have a benefit for uh, people, who, first of all, for parking, and also for taking some of the transport off, uh, off the centre of the town as people move in. Um, food waste was, was mentioned there. It's a legal requirement coming in 24-25 for food waste. We will have to do it. There will be funding towards doing that. Um, it will have to be collected separately, so it will not be. It will still be the ability for residents to have it collected separately. Which brings me on to the IVC. That there is uh, after looked at, but that's a commercial aspect which can't be discussed uh, in 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 this format. Um, on to the uh, meal brace quarter. Let's stop that. So all those aspects, all those tasks at the meal brace quarter have been passed by Active Travel England. Obviously, a 100% solution would be to line it all up. At this moment in time, with the funding that's available, that isn't in the order of the possible. Um, as regards to the roundabout, and I've taken your point. I've went back to officers and asked about that. And the basic point with that is that road and that area isn't big enough for the type of roundabout that uh, you and, and your uh, can, uh, all our councillors in that area have, have asked for. So that's the rea reality from, from the people who um, hopefully know what they're talking about. Um, park homes and, and housing. Again, it shows you how many of these things overlap. Car the the uh, climate change stuff overlaps with lots. So I'll come under housing. I'll bring that up with them as well. And likewise, some of the stuff that was brought up with uh, with the cycling cycling stuff all does come back to the housing side of life as well. Three. Heather, thank you. Um, Ask afterwards. Fly tipping, Gutmage, we do experience quite, uh, not as much fly tipping as all. Where this is coming from, the report comes back from all our councils, and we will take the lead from a lot of other councils who have already done the, trans the transfer from to pay for green waste. And yes, there will be, there, there's a risk with green waste. We didn't want to have to introduce a charge for green waste because we did look and think there's potentially three options. You put it in your residual bin, you, uh, you dump it, or you put it in somebody else's bin, or you indeed you buy. Uh, uh, you pay for your bin. So will be options there, but there are there are, uh, you are experiences. Out of time, if you could wind up. There are experiences from other councils where it has been taken up at quite a high percentage. Thank you. If any points on that, email them to me. I'll get them answered. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, members. So we will move on <coughs> to item 15, which is the annual report of the Place and Overview Committee. So I'm going to invite Councillor Joyce Barrow to present the report and move that we note it. Councillor Barrow. Thank you, Chair. This annual report summarises the work and recommendations of the former Place Overview Committee. The remit of this committee is now covered by the Economy and Environment Overview and Scrutiny Committee, which I chair. 
and I look forward to sharing the progress and the impact that this committee has had in its first year of operation with Council at a meeting during 2024-25. As with all annual reports from scrutiny committees, this looks back over the last full municipal year, in this case 22-23. During this time, the committee explored a wide range of topics. This report summarises some of the work undertaken. Before I go further, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all those members of the committee for their energy and commitment and enthusiasm, and the officers for the support they provided in carrying out this wide programme of work. I'm sure that you will be relieved to hear that I don't intend to go through all of the examples in the report but I would like to refer to a couple of pieces of work that were completed. The committee has been keen to input at an early stage into the development and review of policies. We provided early input into the scope of the parking strategy review that was being shaped, highlighting the need for a tailored approach for different towns and locations, the importance of engaging with town and parish councils, and the alignment with the Shrewsbury Big Town Plan a movement strategy. We have also sought to be responsive to issues that we become aware of as local members and as members of the committee. An example of this was our commissioning of a task and finish group that looked at new housing developments. This was a particularly interesting piece of work where the group heard from council officers, developers and residents and undertook site visits to understand the challenges and issues relating to new housing developments. Further to this, we made policy recommendations on building control, open space management, and Section 38278 agreements related to the adoption of highways on a new development. And finally, I would like to assure Council that the Economy and Environment Overview and Scrutiny Committee will be following up on the progress and impact of the implementation of agreed recommendations that came out of the work carried out by the Place Overview and Community... Sorry. My tongue got stuck there. Place overview and the communities overview committees. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor David Basworth. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> and uh, thank you, Joyce, actually, for your chairing of this committee, because I think this is one of the committees which actually does genuine, genuine good work. So thank you very much. But I wanted to just talk on one aspect of the, of the report before us today, um, basically partly because I'm coming off um, some of my scrutiny committees, um, because I'm going to be mayor of Shrewsbury um, next year, Ooh. and um, <laughs> I will be um, inducted as, uh, as, as the mayor on the 13th of May in the Walker Theatre, and to which you're all very kindly invited to attend. So um, <clears throat> I just thought I'd get that in. I would be very genuinely delighted to see you all there, everybody from all sides of the, uh, of the chamber. <laughs> but, um, but yes, going back to my point, um, the thing which concerns me, I think, and I think concerns all, all um, councillors. Um, I mean, if you, if you talk about your casework, I'm sure that potholes feature very, very largely. Um, I know they do in mine, and I mean, if you are a keen um, um, kind of observer of Fix My Street, which I am, from my sins, you'll notice that potholes appear regularly. And not only um, new potholes, really, yeah. but kind of reoccurring <coughs> potholes, potholes which get repaired once, twice, maybe even three times. So um, one, one of the things that concerned me about the report was the fact that uh, it says here that um, the performance, in, the performance uh, considered was that there were some positive changes in Keir's performance. And I don't think there have been very many positive changes in Keir's performance. And indeed, if you look at um, a, an answer to a question Councillor Taylor made at Cabinet, a very interesting one, which I'd recommend you to all look at, uh, um, but he asked a series of questions about the number of potholes and the effect they've been having on uh, cars. And particularly if you look at one statistic, there's been a 35% increase year on year in the claims for damaged vehicles, which are largely results of potholes. So, um, as you can guess, the theme of my um, speech today is potholes. And I think 
One of the cake things I've been recommending, I hope that in future, future meetings of the Economy and Environment Committee, you can look at KPIs for the number of potholes which have to be continually repaired, because I think that is really important. And also re-examine the um, contract with Keir, which um, when we first had the contract with Keir, and I'm old enough now, I've been on this committee old, long enough, I suppose, to remember when we had, I think it was Round Hay before Keir, and there were great promises were made about the performance of care. Well, they just have not materialized. And we need to look at the contract with care and examine it. And I know Councillor Buckley has raised this in the past as well. And I hope that in the future, a future meetings of the Economy and Environment Committee, which I won't be attending because I'll be mayor, but I hope, I hope, I hope that you <laughs> examine, you examine the contract with Kia and you make sure that the pothole performance of this council improves. Because one of the things which I think brings down the reputation of much of many things, I think, but one of the things which really brings it down in terms of ordinary folk on the ground is the number of potholes, the damage it's doing to their cars, and the fact that we can't get a grip on it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure whether you said that you were going to be Mayor Moore or mentioned the word <laughs> potholes. I think it was about equal, and if you'd mentioned them both once, we'd have saved about four minutes. But anyway, good. At least... Councillor Viv Parry, then Councillor Heather Kidd. Right. Viv. I'm another one that's complaining about potholes. Right. When I went to the, the backbenches on Monday, I told them there was a lovely sign up on one of our main roads coming into Ludlow. It said, Ludlow Town of Potholes. That's what it said, a massive, great big sign. I think people are just about fed up. Our roads are in a terrible state. I know everybody else's roads are in a terrible state. But we're being told that they aren't going to be seen to, to 2025. Um, I'm sorry, I could sit in one of those potholes and I'd still, <laughs> you'd still be able to see the pothole around my bum. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. I'm going to put it in my focus. Um, but the thing is, it says here at, at 7.12 that Kia contract, uh, that they were doing learning how the work should be done. Well, I'm going to tell them they are not learning how the work should be done. The stuff that they're putting in those holes comes out three weeks later. It does not stay. It is rubbish. And I think it's some sort of ash that they're putting in. Maybe it's coming from the, the bio thing in, in Shrewsbury. But the other thing that I've, I've got, I'm going to talk about as well is LED lighting. We, we in Ludlow, uh, I had a look at the list. And Ossestry and Shrewsbury have the most done to their LED lighting. Yeah. Shrewsbury, um, it took me 12 months to get one road, which is Sheep Road. It took me 12 months to get all new LED lighting. Now, I'm sorry, there's something wrong somewhere. If, if uh, the, the list is quite a big one, and seeing as we are not getting maybe the same as Ossestry and Shrewsbury, I would like something done about it. Thank you. Yeah, so take that on board, Josh. You need to shine some light on why the LEDs aren't being done there. Okay. Heather. Yes, but you've been briefed lots of times, which when you extrapolate it makes a long time. But anyway, be brief again. Thank you. Can you put your mic on? Thank you. I would just like to ask a question about who picks up the pothole insurance claims. We saw all of that. I was told at one point that actually Kia were doing that if they were tardy in um, filling potholes. My gut feeling is actually they should be because sometimes they are very slow at, at uh, filling potholes. If it's not, then it's the council picking it up. And there were significant claims. So it's just a simple question on who picks up the cost. Okay, Joyce, just, just um before I bring you back in, I have to say that a lot of what we've heard is relevant, um, yeah. but I'm sure Joyce would have taken these on as suggestions for, for a scrutiny work programme, um, and technically we're commenting on the report that's there as opposed to, but anyway, we are where we are. Councillor Barrow. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things. Thank you, David, for your work on the scrutiny committee. Sure, we're so proud of what you're doing. Microphone. All right. Thank you, Councillor Vassmer. Uh, it was appreciated, all the work you did on my committee. Thank you very much. Um, I will answer a couple of things. I'm not the pot, 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 pot I was going to say pot hole 
yeah, yeah, yeah. portfolio Trying holder. Yeah. So I will answer a couple of things. Um, Fix My Street, actually, I do find it is working far better now. Um, uh, it was improving. When the report said it was uh, improving, it was a lot better than it had been, and it's getting there. They're still working on it. Um, as far as uh, the potholes being filled and it coming out three weeks later, I agree with you, but I think the problem is that they temporarily fill them and then they come back and do the permanent fill. So, but a lot of people don't realise that. Uh, KPI problems, um, are they still be temporary filled? Yes, they are. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Again, we don't need to vote because it's a report for noting. Uh, so we will move on to item 16, which is appointments to committees. Um, I don't think we can have a 20-minute debate on this, but anyway. Um, I ask the Councillor to confirm the following changes uh, to the Northern Planning Committee, that Councillor Colin Taylor be appointed a substitute member of the Northern Planning Committee. And I believe, Brian, you're going to second that? Yes, I'm pleased to second that. Looking around the who, ring for hands. Good. Oh, good. Lots of hands. Okay. I take it everybody's content with that, so we will move on to item 17, which is notices of motion. And we have received a motion from Kirsty Hurst Knight and is supported by Councillors Duncan Kerr, Peggy Mullock, and Tony Parsons. So a real cross cross the landscape there. So Kirsty. Thank you, Chair. Really pleased to bring this motion to Council today and really importantly the cross-party um, fellow members of the Corporate Parenting Steering Board that are here to support us today. The motion for Shropshire Council is to accept a proposal that individuals with care experience are treated as if it were a protected characteristic. To be care experienced as a young person or adult will have mean that you've been looked after by the local authority as a child. The independent review of children's social care headed by J Josh McAllister published in May 2022, and a final report recommends that government should make care experience a protective characteristic. I want to thank, and most importantly, our care leavers who I had the opportunity of meeting with this week. As corporate parents, we have the ap absolute responsibility of representing them and their views. And some of them are here with us today, and that is commitment to sit through this whole meeting to get to this point, so thank you for being here. When we met as a group Monday, we also were joined by Terry Galloway, who, is, who himself was raised in the care system, and he wrote this motion and is supporting councils and care leavers nationally. Today, if passed by Shropshire Council, this will see us be the 83rd council in the UK to adopt care experience as a protective characteristic. I mentioned it earlier, but I'd also thank the cross-party members of the Corporate Parent Steering Board who we have discussed this at length and would like to um, support this motion today. Also, th thanks to Councillor Parsons and to Councillor Kerr who may talk on this motion, but, but would be nice if you would. Um, they've got some views of the young people which I think are really important to share here. Thanks as well to our officers who are working continually to improve and develop and strengthen our care leavers offer. To summarise, but most importantly, to our care leavers who are here today. This is their voice, they, their requirements and their needs that we are expressing. We want to listen to them, we want to understand them and support them. And this thread of listening to a young person absolutely must run through our decision making for them. We ultimately can do this today by supporting this motion. And importantly, I won't go through everything, but the last one, right at the end, I think is really important to pull out. <coughs> Sorry. That the council will continue to proactively seek out and listen to their voices, listen to the care experienced people when developing new policies based on their views. And I think today is the start of this by presenting this motion and more to come. Thank you. Thank you. Tony Parsons. Uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, strongly support uh, this motion, but rather than me telling you why this is such a good thing to do, I, I'd like to give you the, the words of one of our care leavers with regards to this particular motion, who says that it would, it would acknowledge the challenges faced by those with care experience, ensuring they receive adequate support. It would also help reduce stigma and discrimination 
associated with being in care, promoting understanding within society, and it would provide legal protection against discrimination and unfair treatment, allowing individuals to challenge discrimination due to their care experience. And so I would ask all members to support this motion. Thank you. Okay, is that, is that a seconding or? Yes, I'll second as well. Right. Councillor Kerr. Yeah, I'd like to congratulate the um, portfolio holder on bringing this forward. It's a very important um, proposal. And, and I think it has huge practical implications. And like Councillor Parsons, I've got something from one of our care leavers, and I use their words rather than my own. Um, they've been under the care of Shropshire Council since August 2022, they say. In my experience, one of the greatest struggles I have found is with the accessibility as a care leaver and communication around it. When I refer to this, I do not mean the council. I'm instead referring to organisation institutions such as education and other government departments which we rely upon so greatly. My first experience of this was attempting to get a laptop for a grant and enter a programming software to run it. It took a year, effectively, for that to happen. In a similar long-winded manner, after being told multiple times, being estranged from my family would make it difficult to get a passport, I successfully managed to get a passport. Just think that through. Imagine, well, it's hard enough to get a passport anyway. Imagine having to go through all that psychological baggage of having to explain you're estranged from your family and you get a sense of how important this is. So this isn't some sort of theoretical tip box exercise to say we've done this. This will have practical beneficial implications for the children in our care. Um, and he goes on to say, what I would like to state, what I'm hoping for is equality, not imbalance. I view this as a chance to provide my account of where I and others have felt confused, let down and discriminated against, directly or indirectly due to being care leavers. In the event of this motion passing, I hope my words today and the potential further participation can help towards creating equality and present <coughs> for future, for present and future care leavers. I have a fantastic statement you've got there from one of our care leaders, and that's your um, testimony and credit to all, everybody who's worked, who's worked with that care leaver. So I'll leave it there. And I urge you all to vote in favour of it. Julia, you had to think about whether you are going to put your hand up then, didn't you? I could see you cogitating it. Just allowing others to go first. <laughs> Just really welcome this, and of course you have all of our support in the Labour group. It's a really welcome move. Um, and just to say that we will be joining 58 other councils who've already done this. So this is a well-trodden path, and it's absolutely right that we join other councils in doing the right thing. Okay. Kirsty, is there anything else you want to say? Yeah, just nationally, we're 83rd today, if we get this over the line. Just a point. Yeah. Thank you. Good. We all welcome this. Well done. All those in favour, please show. I'm going to say that's unanimous because I don't believe it wouldn't be. So, okay, we will move on to our second motion, which has been received from Councillor Rachel Connolly and is supported by the Labour Group, and it's on digital switchover. Rachel. Thank you. The technology that currently powers landline telephones is to be switched off in 2025. The analog copper wire phone network known as the public switch telephone network is a modern version of 19th century technology. It is what brings the connection into our homes via a copper cable, but by the end of 2025 landline operators in the UK will switch every home phone to an internet based connection instead of the traditional copper wire landlines. The phone network that has existed since the Victorian era is coming to an, the end of its life. While its physical infrastructure remains similar to when it was installed, our communication needs have changed immensely. The way in which people in the UK make phone calls has changed also. While landline calls are still prevalent, around 8 in 10 UK households have a landline service. Most consumers now own a mobile and use this as their main method for making and receiving calls in the home. But many people still depend on their landline, such as those who do not own a mobile phone. Ofcom states that research suggests 4% of UK adults live in a home with a landline and no mobile, 
and that while there has been a steady increase in the uptake of fixed broadband in the UK, 3% of households have only a landline without any broadband. For the majority of people, the change will be straightforward. If you already have a broadband connection, you may just need to plug your phone into your broadband router. However, having to remember to dial an area code from your landline every time you make a call will be something we'll all have to get used to. According to which, there are a million UK voice-only customers, some of whom will not have any access to broadband. People in this group are more likely to be older, financially vulnerable, not working or from lower socio-economic groups. There is also a risk that certain devices that currently rely on a phone line won't work if the line is a digital one. For example, burglar alarms, door entry systems, CCTV, and most importantly, telecare systems for people at risk in their own home. <coughs> Ofcom states that providers should take steps to identify at-risk customers and engage in effective communications to ensure all eligible customers are protected throughout the upgrade process. However, it appears that this may, be, may vary depending which provider you are with. For example, Ofcom has announced an investigation into one provider's migration, citing concerns around its treatment of vulnerable customers. Unlike some traditional corded analogue phones, a digital phone will only work in a power cut if it has a battery backup because it will run using your home electricity. In these instances, phone companies are advising people to use mobile phones as a backup. If you're dependent on your landline phone, for example, if you don't have a mobile phone or you live somewhere where there's no or poor mobile signal, which is quite common in Shropshire, then your telephone provider must offer you a resilience solution to make sure you can make emergency calls during a power cut. Telephone providers will be contacting customers in advance to let people know when the system is changing and what needs to be done, and in some cases an engineer will need to visit to make changes. I am sure you will all appreciate that for our elderly and vulnerable residents, being contacted by telecoms companies may seem suspicious and they may choose not to engage. As the switchover is affecting millions of homes, this can create an opportunity for criminals to develop new scams. These scam attempts could happen over the phone, via email, or in person on the doorstep. All the documents I have been reading regarding this major change to our telecommunications <coughs> make it very clear that the onus is on the customer to contact their provider to find out more and decide what service they wish to choose. For the more vulnerable in the community, I feel this could be difficult, as they will need more guidance and assistance through this change. We have a higher than average population aged 65 and over and many of our residents live in rural areas with poor connectivity. Residents should feel confident that they are safe in their own home and are able to contact people in an emergency. Communication and support from a source such as Shropshire Council could mitigate any difficulties, which is why I have brought this motion to Council today and I hope you will support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And who is seconding it? Thank you. Now, I understand that there is a proposed amendment. Robert Macy. Yes, Chair. Um, do you want me to speak to that name? Well, I think so. Have you have you yep. seen the amendment? Yes. Yeah. Do you, are you willing to take the amendment on board or? No. No. Okay. Well, then we will deal with the amendment. Robert. Okay, thank you. Um, I've proposed an amendment to this motion. Um, it's in support of the ethos of the original motion, and it is an issue that obviously we've discussed previously and has been brought to attention of the council by myself and opposition members um, in that time. I hope the amendment actually strengthens the original motion in the following ways. <laughs> The fact that it mentions, as just addressed now, the mention of mobile coverage addresses one of the known challenges that would be faced by some residents in the event of a power cut. By amending the council beliefs section, I think this strengthens what we're asking for from the telephone providers to do, as the Ofcom regulator has set out several requirements, and this is including around telecare, for example, there are specific requirements. Um, there is also a suggestion that these might be revisited as well. There was recently a charter released 
for the PSTN network, which a number of the providers have signed up to. So this would mean that we're always trying to chase what the regulator is asking for currently as that updates. Um, and in the final, the council commits section, I think it should probably recognize the work that's already taking place around the switch over. Um, we have the website and other ways of raising awareness already up and running. The cross-party working group, which I established because of the comments from councillors around my annual report, including councillors like Heather Kidd and others, had raised that this was going to be an issue. Um, to date, not all the opposition groups have yet appointed representatives to that, so that, that would be great if we can get that moving. We did organise the first meeting of that group, um, but it wasn't attended. Um, but I'm quite committed to keeping the group going as outlined and, and taking those, as we said in the amendment, taking how we move this forward as a council to that group to inform that. Um, and in terms of creating a network, we're in, we're in the, sort of the realms of duplicating the effort that's already going on. Currently, our head of ICT co-chairs the Shropshire Digital Inclusion Network with Age UK, and this group's perfectly placed to consider the issue on a wider basis. In fact, it did so at its meeting that they held this morning, um, and the meeting had a number of useful conversations were held about some of the challenges that are coming through locally and some of the advice that different organisations had communicated out and how they could work together. So we'd continue to work with that network in terms of the outcomes of any of the discussions they have. In addition to the commitments, obviously, we still have initiatives like the Digital Skills Programme taking place across the county through a variety of partners to increase skills. Um, and I've had a request from a couple of members, so just to make clear as well, as we would issue a briefing note to members of the current state of play and what's available. But I think the amendment to, that we've circulated to the, the motion just brings it into line with what we're actually what we're actually doing to this and hopefully strengthens it in those ways. Thank you. Okay. And is your amendment being seconded by you, Clack? Yes. Right. Thank you can't second your own motion, Rob. You didn't need no. we had no, that. Okay. No. All right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, he forgot himself and pointed. I know we've been here a long time, yeah. but I'm not gonna I couldn't allow that. Clack. I formally second and reserve my right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Heather. Um, I've been reminded that actually it was me that raised this in the council chamber. I do actually vaguely, re well, I, I've done a lot on this and I've actually been working behind the scenes with Ben, uh, ben Walker um, and actually have lots of detail on this as well. I remember the digital working group being set up, but I was too heavily involved in the rural proofing I just couldn't do that one as well at the same time and that's one of those issues what I can say is everybody is being contacted um, and I have a number of people in my division there are at least three who are off grid no electricity and so their their phone line is really important which is why I raised it um, and what Ben has been telling me on all of this is that actually now there is an opt-in system, and actually they cannot take your landline away from you. So all of that is in place. I have all those details. Um, I have all the links for people to do that. I raised it again when I was told that I was going to be moved over to Digital Voice two weeks ago. So they are all doing that, um, and the council is working on it, and Ben Walker is really well informed. Julia. Yes, I think that we should uh, really welcome the comments from Rob and the intention of your amendment, which is to recognise the work that you've already done and a lot of the things that are already in place. Um, but there are still lots of people who are not aware. And so if there's been a problem that members haven't been able to attend or get engaged, that residents aren't aware, there is still a gap there. And I'm wondering if we can um, find an amendment that works for both of you. I think you both have the same intention here which is to ensure that the actions you're already taking could be maximised to make sure that no vulnerable residents are left behind. Would you consider an amendment which recognises the work you're already doing, but that builds on that work, so that we're confident that nothing is left uh, overlooked, but that what we're doing is being really clear that a lot of, a lot of work has already taken place? I, I the 
problem I've got is I suppose it depends on the nature of what you're asking it, the council to do going forward. It's set out in the three points there, isn't it, to, um, so that the network would advise particularly the vulnerable and senior citizens. So to build on your, in your words, it would build on your existing support network, but we're just saying that it would target senior citizens and most vulnerable. And the last point, that you would work with partnerships to regularly communicate via social media. It's just that proactive piece about communicating externally. Perhaps you are already doing all of the things in that list, in which case we could just say, building on your existing work to do these things, at the moment, it, it's, not, it's not being done at the moment externally. Um, I, I think I probably wouldn't, just because I think that's covered in the first point of what I've put in the amendment, which is to continue providing information for residents about the digital switchover right. through the web page and other communication. It's not going to limit it. And in the second part, I think right. the digital connectivity group can consider those. I'm things. going to draw a little bit so, of a line underneath yeah. it because it it um, it has somewhat rather become a, a little bit of a debate between the two of you. Obviously, I don't think Rob's going to take that on. Julia, do you have anything else you say before I bring Councillor Carroll in? Just to say, it's a shame. There's cross-party support for the activity. I think it's really a shame that you can't agree on some simple words that capture that, so the public will actually Thank know. You what you are doing at this point they do not. Councillor Carroll. Thank you Chairman. I think the last couple of minutes have demonstrated the debates going around in circles so I move the vote be put. Okay. I think we were pretty well much coming to moving on voting on the amendment anyway because I've got no, nobody else on the list. So there is an amendment that has been tabled um, on behalf of the Conservative group. Claire, you did reserve your right. Do you want to say anything or not? No, I'm content to take the vote. Thank you, Chairman. All right. I do need to let the original proposer come back, though, so you can sit down for a minute. <laughs> OK. Rachel. Oh. You do have the right of reply, although you're second a dozen. You have the right of reply as the okay. original proposer on the amendment. Thank you. I, I mean, I'm really pleased that I can hear some more information today but it's a shame that it's taken this for me to have to do this to find all this information out. We may know a fair bit about things, but it's not necessarily being disseminated to the people that it really matters to. Um, but that's what I need to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you. OK. So you've all seen the amendment that's been put forward by Councillor Robert Macy and supported by the Conservative group. All those in favour, please show. Gates, please show. Any abstentions? Two abstentions. Okay, so that was. 35 for the amendment, 20 against and two abstentions. That means that that has now become the substantive, so we need to take another vote. Yes. Uh, the reason I couldn't vote for the amendment is that there is a significant communication problem, a significant one. And, and actually, had that been dealt with, I could have voted for that. The only reason I know what I know is because one particular resident I have has been continually asking questions um, and I've been backing him up and that is why I've been given all the information that people need to be able to opt into the system if they're vulnerable, elderly, they need their landline. The big issue around the landline being removed is if you have no electricity, you have no f mobile, you're stuck, and the copper at the moment brings in the electricity to run your ordinary phone. It, for me, the big thing is that everybody needs to know in some way or other that 
how to make sure you keep your landline. And it's far from clear when you get the advice from the, um, whichever phone company you have. It's far from clear. So the communication thing is the thing I'm really, really keen that we get across to everybody because we have too many mobile not spots and we have too many people who actually find using the digital systems very difficult at the present time. That time will go and they know that it will go, but at the moment it's a, it's a difficult thing. So what I need Rob's group to do um, and why I'm probably going to end up voting for this is because I'm really worried that the communication is so poor. And if I hadn't been involved in several months of emails, um, I wouldn't know what I know today. Okay, I've got Councillor Leslie Picton. Went off for some reason. Councillor Leslie Picton and then Councillor Chris Schofield. Leslie. Yeah, I mean, the comment that I would make, Heather, is that I've had exactly the same um, experience as you have. I suppose what I'm saying is that I was disappointed that actually Rob did go to a significant amount of trouble to get the officers and everything to that meeting and it wasn't attended. So please, can I ask the group leaders to ensure that that group is attended? And also, the group is already, as, as Rob pointed out in the first part of the amendment, it's, we're not resting on our laurels, there is more work to do. But as we know, the best work comes when we all put our heads together. Councillor Chris Cofield. Uh, briefly, Chair. Um, by all means, Shropshire Council, I think they should do everything and, and allay the fears, especially of the elderly, elderly and the vulnerable. But at the same time, I honestly think that the, the companies who are providing these, this new service should be held to account with it and for them to put out the information and not the, all the owners to be on Shropshire Council. Councillor Rob Macy. I think just, just heard, taking that point, there is, the, there is an onus on us. Ironically, one of the things on the agenda for that first meeting was a communications plan of how do we communicate and who do we link with. Um, so, but I would say that it is going to be through working with the partners. Age UK, for example, have got a website up and running. They've got information. They've got contacts and networks. It is joining those together. But what the point I was trying to make in this is that network exists and that debate exists already. So... Hopefully that will get picked up, um, but there will be another meeting soon and we'll hopefully make more progress. Okay, so we voted on making the amendment the substantive. We are now going to vote on the substantive, <laughs> which is the amendment for those that didn't hear what I said the first time. So all those in favour, please show. I think that's going to be unanimous unless anybody sticks around up to say they didn't want to vote for it. All right, that's unanimous. Good. Thank you. We will move then on to questions from members. Um, six questions are allowed. Any one has been received, I understand. And that's a councillor, uh, Dan Thomas. Councillor Thomas, do you have a supplementary question? No. Just to say thank you for, to the portfolio holder and the officers for a very detailed response. That's all right. Thank you very much. And we will then move on to item 19, which is the report of the Shropshire and Reekin Rescue Authority. We could have asked them when they were here earlier, couldn't we? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to invite Councillor David Minnery. To present yeah, the report yeah, and yes, thank you, Chair. Well, unfortunately, my, my laptop's just decided to reconfigure itself. So I, I haven't got the report in front of me, but I will formally move <laughs> that the report be adopted. Yeah, and I would like to just draw members' attention. I know it's the last item. We all want to go home. But the final page, uh, foot of page three, um, there is the news on the, the white paper, which had threatened the future existence of the fire authority. That has now been resolved. Um, the threat of the PCC has gone away. I'm sure we'll all be really pleased to know that. Um, I am involved in a working party with the Home Office, which is why I was late this morning, on the operational independence, which is the last item on, on the report. And fresh off the press is, as of yesterday morning, I've been appointed to the LGA Fire Commission. So the voice of Shropshire, particularly rural Shropshire, will be heard very loud and very clear in the corridors of power. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Kevin. Um, I'm, I'm glad Councillor Minnery's 
made that quite clear. And what I want to do is, um, is to thank everybody on that fire authority as a former firefighter um, that we fought off this um, John Campion PCC. Um, he didn't sort of lend himself favorably to anybody on that committee, whether Tory or not. So it, it was really good for me to see that the fire service came before politics. And it, it, it was a wonderful thing to see. So I, I, I thank everybody on that committee. You know, I think Councillor Minnery will remember the first day that the PCC, police PCC, came to visit us. And the, one of the first things he said was, Right, we'll get rid of control within six months. And that's, that's what the fire service were up against. They're an efficient, good fire service. And, and I thank everybody for what they did to ensure that it carries on that way. Good. Thank you very much. I will thank everybody. It has been a little bit of a marathon session. Um, in fact, technically we're finishing later than last, last meeting's Budget Council. But um, I guess there's an election coming up maybe. I don't know. Okay, members, thank you very much, all of you. Stay safe, safe journeys home, and uh, see you at the next meeting.